I am Assemblyman Brian Kolb. Uh, I represent the 131st Assembly District, uh, which is all of Ontario County and the northern half of Seneca County. And I also serve as the Assembly Republican Leader in uh, New York State Government. And today joining me are uh, my fellow colleagues who I will introduce briefly. So what I'd like to do is just give you a quick rundown of what we're going to do today. And uh, we're going to get started because we're, we're here to listen uh, to you. That's the most important uh, reason why we're here. Uh, first of all, uh, what I'd like to do is um, just point out a couple of housekeeping items. Number one, the restrooms are out the doors and to my left, for those out in the audience looking at me, that would be to your right. Uh, you can see the exit signs in case of emergency. We have along the side and the uh, uh, rear of the room. Uh, also, uh, we are recording this. Uh, we are webcasting this as we speak. And we are also video recording, uh, so if anybody would like a copy of, of today's uh, forum, uh, you can contact our offices and we'll be more than willing to share this with you or so that you may share it with others. Uh, we also have, uh, for those that brought written testimony or written comments, uh, we, do, uh, we are collecting those at the rear of the room uh, with our staff. And uh, we also have some comment cards uh, that if you're um, so inclined to fill out some comment cards, we would appreciate those as well. Uh, basically, this is the, you, you know, you've read about different forums throughout the state uh, that are being held uh, by the State Education Commissioner, John King. Uh, this is a separate endeavor uh, from the commissioner and his visits. Uh, this has been a series of statewide forums. This is our seventh that our conference, the Assembly Republican Conference, has held uh, throughout the state. We have, uh, I think, at least five more to go to finish out mid-December. And uh, this is something where we're looking for public comments, input, reactions, good, bad, or indifferent, uh, regarding the Common Core standards and uh, whatever's on your mind about uh, Common Core. And that's what uh, today is all about. And uh, certainly, uh, what I, as I go through the introductions here, um, the folks that have joined me at the table here, uh, two gentlemen to my far left on the end here, we have two assemblymen that have been traveling all uh, all over the state to each and every one of these forums, uh, but they're also uh, new to the Rochester area uh, because uh, Assemblyman uh, Ed Ra, and who was on the I think the far end, right, and uh, Al Graff next to him, they came from all the way down in Long Island. So uh, let's give them a Rochester welcome. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with Ed. Uh, on my left, we'll eat, have each of the members introduce themselves, brief, brief comment about what their, what their district are, any other brief comment they want to share, and then what we're going to do immediately after the members uh, say a very brief you, key word, you keep hearing that, brief word, uh, then we're going to uh, call up uh, folks that have asked to be heard. Uh, we do have a speaking list. Uh, we've got at least 40 people. So we're going to really ask your cooperation today because we want to try to get everybody's input on the record. Uh, so if you can keep your remarks approximately or questions to two minutes, uh, that would be great. It's just to facilitate to get as many people here uh, to have their opportunity to share their thoughts. So I, I already got a question. Well, uh, that is correct. Um, what we didn't realize, which is a great question, um, there was such an overwhelming number of people, so we're going to try to fit it in as much as possible. So if there's a way, you know, if it goes a little over two or three minutes, it's not going to be a major deal. But uh, I know that uh, sometimes people can go on and on and on about a point, so if you can just keep your, your remarks pointed, that would be great. Okay? And also, by the way, uh, if you know, if there's additional things uh, that you want to get on the record, I would also encourage you to send us an email or a letter uh, to get that entire input that we will add to the record if there's something that you really feel uh, needs to be said that did not get said. Okay, so we want to try to hear from you as much as possible. We're just overwhelmed by the amount of response that we've heard, which is terrific. So that means people care about this issue. Uh, so with that, starting on my left, uh, Ed, uh, take it away. Thank you, Leader. Uh, just want to quickly, uh, by way of introduction, 
Uh, I am uh, fortunate to have been appointed to be the ranking minority member on the Education Committee by Leader Kolb, uh, which uh, is a great uh, honor for me, but it's also been a, a great responsibility. Uh, and in that realm, myself, uh, some of you graph, uh, have been traveling throughout the state, as, as Leader Kolb said, hearing from parents. So uh, we're interested in hearing from you tonight, but I want to make sure you all also uh, realize that this should be a continuing conversation. Um, not just ending tonight. Uh, there's a lot of work that can be done and needs to be done. So I hope you will continue that conversation. And just uh, lastly, if I can uh, publicly uh, thank the leader for having the resources of our central staff in Albany and all of our regional offices uh, to, because uh, he saw the importance of this issue and the importance of hearing directly from the people who are dealing with this issue. And as a result, uh, we've gotten great support from, from our staff both in Albany and in all the regional offices and putting these on. So thank you very much, Leader. I look forward to hearing from all of you tonight. My name is Al Graff, and if anybody has any problem understanding my Long Island accent, Assemblyman Hawley has told us he will translate. <laughs> With that, before we left session, I put in a bill to withdraw from Race to the Top and from Common Core. The purpose of that was to start a conversation, and I think we did throughout the entire state. So I want to thank everybody for coming out here, because this is an important issue, it's an important topic, and it affects our children. And I just wanted to say thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to listening to you here tonight. Good evening. I'm Assemblyman Bob Oaks. I represent all of Wayne County, Northern Cayuga, and parts of Oswego County. And one of the benefits of representing the eastern side of the Rochester media market is it also goes into the uh, Syracuse uh, media market as well. And so on Monday evening, uh, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, these gentlemen and uh, colleagues who represent some of the areas uh, around uh, Syracuse and, and uh, that general area to uh, get a lot of input from individuals. And I saw the passion uh, uh, that was expressed and heard uh, so many stories, and uh, I learned an awful lot. And that's my purpose uh, to be here this evening. Um, I will say that uh, forum did go on a bit long. Uh, if this one goes on as long, uh, I need to uh, present some awards to outstanding students uh, tonight. And so if I sneak out, that's where I'm uh, going to go. But uh, I look forward to hearing all of your comments. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank Assembly Minority Leader Cole for uh, putting this together today. Uh, I'm Mark Johns. I represent the 135th District, where we have four of the finest school districts in the state if not the country. That's Webster, Penfield, Harrington, which is Fairport Schools, and East Rochester. So uh, it, it's an honor to be here today. I, I do apologize for looking the way I do. Uh, got a little bit of a bulge on my left eye here. Uh, I play basketball at lunch sometimes when I'm not doing my assembly work. And uh, I, when I got bumped today, I told people, I said, we can't have all these old, uncoordinated guys out here running up and down the court. And they said, oh, Mark, you can still play. You know, so. Anyway, I apologize for looking the way I do, but I'm here to listen, and hopefully we'll learn something and take it back off. And so thank you all for coming out today. My name is Bill Nojay. I represent a district that includes parts of Monroe County, town of Pickford, Menden, Wheatland, Rush, the village of uh, Scottsville, and down uh, all of Livingston County, and the northern part of Sabin County, including the city of Hornell. Uh, a number of the other towns uh, in Bend County. And my mother is a, uh, was a teacher uh, for many years in the uh, Rochester City School District, uh, which I attended. Uh, started out at number 39, went on to 22 schools, and still uh, stopped by those places every once in a while as an alumnus. Uh, I, she also taught in the Fairport Schools, and my uh, cousin currently teaches in one of the other suburban schools. So I learn uh, what's going on uh, currently uh, in, in uh, our public schools and uh, very happy to be here today. And also want to thank uh, Assemblyman Ra and uh, Assemblyman Graff for coming up to our neck of the woods 
uh, to, uh, to see how we live up here. Uh, although Assemblyman uh, Graff, where, what town were you the supervisor? Town of, town of Brighton in uh, the North Country near the, the Adirondacks, more my wife's uh, neck of course. So uh, thank you all everybody for coming and I look forward to your comments. Good afternoon everyone, I'm uh, Steve Hawley. I represent the uh, western side of Monroe County, uh, the towns of Hamlin and Clarkson, uh, Sweden, including of course Brockport, uh, Riga, including the village of Churchville, uh, plus a little west of there, all of Orleans County, except for one town, and all of Genesee County. Uh, I've been serving the last seven and a half years in the assembly, uh, and I served, uh, was serving when I got elected to the assembly in a special election uh, on the Genesee Valley, both the Board of Education. Uh, so I've seen firsthand uh, how uh, the Education Department can uh, mandate uh, without funding in many cases, as is the case with Common Core, uh, and we're here tonight to. Uh, hear your thoughts, your concerns, your observations, and your suggestions on how to make this right, or as uh, the downstate uh, assemblyman says, uh, do away with it completely. So we look forward to your comments. Uh, as someone else said last night, we were in Alden, uh, and that was scheduled from 6 until 8. Uh, we got out of there about 9.20 p.m. So feel free to talk, but as the leader said, no more than 2 minutes and 18 seconds or so. Look forward to hearing from you. All right, thank you. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, we have a, a list of names that uh, have pre-registered to uh, to speak, and uh, so we're going to start off with Dan. And uh, also, when you get up to the podium, feel free to correct me on the pronunciation of your names. Uh, uh, Dan Delahanty, is that correct? Uh, Daniel Delahanty, actually. And gentlemen, thank you for holding this education forum tonight. I appreciate the the wisdom in uh, listening to your constituents, and uh, it's greatly appreciated. Um, I did prepare comments for five minutes, uh, so uh, as a teacher, I, I worked very hard on tailoring it to exactly five minutes. So I will, I will do my best to to uh, improvise um, and be respectful of, of your time and the audience's time. Um, again, my name is Daniel Delahanty. I'm a proud resident of the city of Rochester, and I'm gladly send my children to city schools because I believe diversity and integration is essential to my children's education. I am also a national board certified teacher of social studies who teaches in a district um, that uh, struggles with the obstacles of poverty. I am a proud of uh, the many efforts of dedicated teachers in my district that innovate new curriculum and work to make learning meaningful for our children. Um, and that is who this has to be about, the children, all children, being given an equal opportunity for education. When I studied educational leadership at the University of Rochester, one of my professors stated, the best thing we could do as educational leaders was to focus on what was within our spheres of influence. For the past 14 years, I've tried to do just that. I've expended my energies on my family and my classroom. My classroom is the Teaching and Learning Institute, a magnet program for future teachers and leaders at East High School. By all measures, our program has been quite successful. I could bury my head in the sand and continue to tell myself that all is okay, but it is not. I can no longer stay silent about the attack on our public education system where our most vulnerable students, those that are largely poor and minorities, are paying the price required by the profiteers running our newly corporatized educational system. The testing of elementary students must stop. The testing required to evaluate teachers must stop. The constant testing of new Common Core standards must stop. The high-stakes testing required for graduation must end. Ethically, I am bound to tell you that every time I give a test where my students do not get to see the results and learn from them, I'm doing them a disservice. It does not serve them. It only serves the state. Testing has become an obstacle to learning. It literally discourages quality teaching rather than promoting it. I call for the resignation of Commissioner King. The New York State Board of Regents under his administration has failed us with its over-reliance on standardized testing, with tying teachers' evaluations to these tests 
With its inept rollout of the Common Core standards and with its anti-democratic push to open more charter schools, together these policies are an affront to public education. Meanwhile, few among our state and federal leaders address the real problem. We have a segregated educational school system. We have created a school system of haves and have-nots. The state content to write checks for massive amounts of money for city schools, has actually turned its back on our neediest children. As community after community has segregated by law its school districts to prevent students of color and students of poverty from going to class with more affluent, privileged students across the state. It does not matter what standards, what kinds of tests, what amount of money you spend on an impoverished district where 90% of the students live in poverty. Separate is not equal. When districts in Monroe County are rated by the Rochester Business Journal as among the top places to educate our children, and then our city is ranked dead last, that is not a source of pride. That is criminal. We should be ashamed. We are one community. We need to recognize this and recognize that the school district boundaries we legally reinforce do not serve us, but perpetuate the suffering of our children. Will you step up in this madness of over-testing APPR and charter schools and join me in speaking the truth? Will you call for a countywide school district? Will you exercise leadership where it is needed most? The effects of concentrated poverty on academic performance are clear. Study the work of Richard Kallenberg, senior fellow at the Century Foundation, when the poverty level of a school goes up, the average achievement level goes down. Study the countywide school district of Wake County, North Carolina, to see what success truly looks like. We must dilute the poverty level of our schools to see achievement go up. Remember, we let our children compete on the basketball court and on the athletic field. Why not let suburban and city students compete in the classroom? Until that happens, City graduation rates will remain below 60%. Corporate profiteers will continue to make money off of excessive testing, and hundreds of millions of dollars will be wasted. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Dorothy Petrie. Good afternoon. Today I'll be speaking on the idea of college and career readiness, how it specifically relates to the Common Core Standards for Mathematics. Much has been said by the proponents of the Common Core, business leaders, politicians, about the importance of encouraging more students to pursue courses of study in college in a STEM field, those being science, technology, engineering, math. It has been asserted that if the U.S. is to maintain its historic preeminence in the fields of STEM, that it must produce approximately one million more STEM professionals over the next decade. It's also been very well documented that nearly 60% of students who enter college do so, do so without the math, schools, uh, math skills needed for STEM majors. Dr. James Milgram, Professor Emeritus of Mathematics at Stanford University, served on the Validation Committee for the Common Core Math Standards. He refused to sign off on those standards because doing so would have required him to assert that they reflected international expectations in math, but they are considerably lower, below that level. Algebra 1 in seventh grade is the international expectation. Furthermore, Professor Jason Zimba, the lead writer of the Common Core Math Standards, spoke before the Massachusetts Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. With regard to the notion of college readiness, he stated, we have agreement that to the extent that it's a fuzzy definition, that a minimally college ready student is a student who passes Algebra II. When questioned by the panel, not for STEM, not for international competitiveness, Professor Zimba responded, not only for STEM, it's also not for selective colleges. Now I've checked with UB, I've checked with SUNY Stony Brook, I've checked with Georgia Tech and RIT. The prerequisite math courses for engineering coursework are three years of high school math, including trigonometry and logarithms, and at least one course of differential calculus. And yes, 
you could take those courses your first semester in college. However, if the first math course that you take in college is pre-calculus, the odds of obtaining a four-year STEM degree, 2%. If the highest math course that a student takes in high school is Algebra 2, that's where the common course standards end, their chances of achieving a four-year degree in any field is 39%. Recently, my husband asked me, Dorothy, why are you doing this? Uh, why are you fighting this and why are you speaking out on this? Our child will be fine. And he's right. Our child performed wonderfully on the recent New York State exams in ELA and math. But I thought about my father, who grew up in poverty in northern New York. He went to first grade at the age of five because there was no kindergarten. He lost his mother, his aunt, both his grandparents by the age of 12 within a two-year period. He went on, he graduated at the age of 16 from high school, and then he did a year of postgraduate work, because you could do funky things like that back then. And he went to Canton ATC, and then he, did a, um, he later did seven years of night school at RIT to get his bachelor's and become an electrical engineer. Um, he beat the odds, but he never forgot how difficult it was, and he never forgot how many other young people he knew fall through the cracks. Our students today deserve more than a vague, meaningless buzz phrase, college and career ready. They deserve the truth. They deserve to know the odds. And the Common Core math standards, as they stand, will not adequately prepare them to do college level work in a STEM-related course of study. These standards won't do what the proponents are say that they will do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dear. Rachel Rosner. Hello. I am the proud parent of two children with autism. The Common Core Standards for ELA and Math are both hundreds of pages long. The document outlining application for students with disabilities is two pages long. Not 200 pages. Two pages. The Common Core State Standards were implemented in 2010, but the New York State Test Access and Accommodations Guide has not been updated since 2006. Kindergarten Common Core Standards for Speaking and Listening, number three, expect students to be able to ask and answer questions to seek help, obtain information, or clarify what they do not understand. The development of self-advocacy and executive function skills are just beginning for a kindergarten student, and their development is a lifelong struggle for a person with a developmental disability. It would take me days to outline the dozens of similar examples throughout the standards that highlight the nature of my children's disabilities and do nothing to measure their knowledge or their skills. Having a cognitive or language-based disability does not mean that a person is not intelligent or capable, but that is how the Common Core State Standards make my daughter feel every day at school. She was forced to relearn multiplication this year so that she will be able to get full credit on her tests, and she has ELA assignments that are entirely inappropriate for a fifth grader, let alone one with a developmental disability. My daughter should not have homework that makes her cry. The Common Core Standards are in effect bullying my daughter and thousands of others like her. The implementation of the Common Core is a violation of my daughter's rights under the Dignity for All Students Act. And I find it extremely ironic that they're being implemented simultaneously. The vast majority of students with these types of disabilities will never be able to pass these tests the standards themselves, the tests, and the accommodations are biased and discriminatory against students with learning differences. As the saying goes, there's more than one way to skin a cat, but not when you take the Common Core-based examination. In that case, there's only one permitted way to answer each question. If a child arrives at the correct answer, but not in the way that the test prescribes, they cannot receive full credit for that answer. This completely eliminates the need to teach children multiple ways to solve a problem. Isn't that the opposite of what we want for our children? Isn't that the opposite of universal design for learning principles, which the Common Core is supposed to be based on? 
Don't we want to teach our students to be creative, divergent thinkers? That testing accommodation guide states, testing accommodations must be consistent with instructional accommodations currently in place in the classroom. But the reverse is not true. The accommodations put in place in the classroom are not permitted on these types of tests or on the Regents' exams. Making accommodations that will allow my son to demonstrate his knowledge will not adversely affect anybody else or the validity of the test. And it will allow him to demonstrate his grasp of the material that he works so hard to learn every single day. It is imperative that we eliminate the Common Core in New York State. The goal of education is to allow children to realize their full potential, not to pass untested, invalid tests created by business, not educators created before the standards themselves were even completed. My children are competent and smart. Their future should not be in jeopardy because of the Common Core. Changes are needed immediately, and our children cannot wait for them. Thank you, Rachel. Aggie Sunway. Good evening. Um, it's very nice that you came here today. We appreciate it. And um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you, this is my speech. Now, I've been provided the opportunity to come here and speak, but I wasn't told what I had to do, how I had to do it, how long I had. Well, kind of. Um, but I, So I thought maybe I would try something that maybe our kids might be allowed to. So the first thing I did was I brought a shoe. All right? Does it fit? Mr. Mr. Oaks, does it? It might fit. How are you going to find out, huh? It, well, how are you going to find out if it fits? You're going to have to try it, right? So somehow we're going to have to assess the fact of whether or not this shoe fits you. Now I'm going to look down here at Mr. Holly. You like this shoe? You do like it? You do? Well, what about Mr. Noje? I don't think this would be the kind that you would wear. Doesn't it? Does just kind of? Well, you don't know. I, I don't know. Be, I don't know. Were you my teacher once? I remember I, this style. <laughs> I don't know. And the only way I'm going to know is if I get to know my students and I look at each one of my students and say, what fits them? All right? So, Mr. Kolb, are you laughing? I'm smiling. Are you smiling? I'm watching. This poor man, he's held up 30 seconds. and didn't stop and it's not worked yet. Um, <laughs> my point to you, I've been in education for 50 years and I've done it all but the um, drive a bus because the transportation director won't let me, he doesn't trust me behind the wheel. Uh, my passion is very, very deep. And I, th I thought about, um, a, a parent gave this to me, all creatures great and small. And I thought about that and I looked at it and there's an elephant, giraffe, there's a man on here. And they're all in the same boat, and they're probably trying to go the same place. Is each one of these going to be given the same thing? Probably not. Probably I'm going to have to do something different with the elephant than I am with a giraffe. Just like I'm going to have to do something different with Mr. Noje and the shoes than anybody. And then I got to thinking, what about, if we use all these words, we use education, we use curriculum. Did anybody stop to think, what do they really mean? So I looked up education. It comes from the Latin word. If you have any Catholic background, you know that you have four years of Latin. It comes from the Latin word educere, and it means to lead into. So our rule in education is to lead into. Well, then I thought, all right, let's look up curriculum. And I'm not going to pronounce that as well. Um, it came from a Latin word, and it means race or course of a race. So we have leading into, and then we have really like a route that we want the kids to go. And what route is that going to be? In the 21st century, the route would have to be something connected with the global world, where our kids can think, problem solve, and not spit out the answer of Hmm, who was the 33rd President of the United States? We could look that right up on Google. Thank you. I missed it. I missed it. 
Jackie and Katie. Jackie and Katie. Did I get that right, Jackie? Hi. I'm Jacqueline Cady. I've been a long-term advocate for quality early education, and I'm affiliated with the Early Childhood Development Initiative here in Rochester. My interest is in the Common Core as it affects developmentally appropriate early education, ages 0 to 8. I, I, unlike some of the speakers, I'll admit that some of the idea of the Common Core has some strength. In the city of Rochester, our children have high mobility. A consistent curriculum could be helpful for that because a lot of our kids don't end up the year where they started out the year. Uh, who can object to setting a high bar? We certainly need our children to develop the skills and knowledge to be gainfully employed, to be contributing citizens. But so far from what we've seen, the implementation of these standards is questionable, at least. Uh, for little ones, the core knowledge curriculum offered in the Engage New York materials is developmentally appropriate in many instances. Implementation in some venues has required rigid adherence to guidelines, scripts, content that doesn't meet the needs of many of our children. So what's quality early education? The best early education involves hands-on learning, a curriculum centered on play, opportunities to explore. We want children to experience fun and excitement and to develop a sense of inquiry and a love of learning. A rigid curriculum with too much sitting and not enough doing doesn't support these goals. There are special considerations for some of our children. Years of research show that boys learn differently than girls. They need even more time for that act of learning. In the city of Rochester, a high percentage of children have experienced trauma and violence. Research shows, in terms of brain development, that attention has to be given to their socio-emotional learning to enable that child to calm himself, for his brain to be engaged and be ready for cognitive growth. The Common Core implementation is not leaving time enough to meet the developmental needs of many of these children. I know that you are not the creators nor the implementers of this curriculum, but as the opportunity arises, I ask you to keep in the back of your mind the need for schools to be ready for the children, for a curriculum to be flexible to meet the child where he is and then gradually scaffold that learning toward the higher standards. Daniel White. Good afternoon. Uh, and sincere thanks to you for taking the time out to speak from the, the public and education on a very important issue. Um, you're going to hear a lot of a lot of remarks this afternoon, many legitimate remarks on a, on a lot of different issues adjacent to the Canadian Common Core. And I wanted to make a couple of simple points and then maybe we'll, I'm sorry, I want to make a couple of simple points and then I will I'll clear out and maybe get ahead of get ahead of schedule here a little bit. First of all I want to make the, the, the point that common core standards are enforcement. They're anchored to not curriculum, how you assess them, all those things are adjacent to but they're sorry. Yeah, I will. My apologies. Um, I, I, thank you. I wanted to make the point that the, the Common Core standards are just that. They are anchor standards. How you assess them, how you use the data, all of those different things are adjacent to but not enforced. Um, it's true there's been an uneven implementation across the country. In general, I think you're going to hear that the core standards are solid. They're not perfect, but they're solid. Where I see problems or where I think there could be some help in a couple different areas, the districts that have struggled to implement are the ones that are low resource. They have not been able to put the, the time and the resources behind their teachers to put proper training, for curricular materials, and you're seeing a real uneven implementation of New York State for a couple of years. You cannot do a standards adjustment on the achievement. And frankly, in a time of great economic need for a lot of our districts, that there needs to be more support for our educators in the classroom to make this work. In the very long run, I believe the Common Core state standards can be successful. The support has to be there for our educators. I believe deeply that our teachers can make the adjustments in the classroom. They have to have the time and the opportunity to do so. Thank you. All right. Dan Graham Dramovich. Dramovich. How close did I get that? 
pretty good. Thank you. Um, my name is Dan Dermasich. I'm a retired principal and teacher from the Rochester City School District. I'm also the uh, chairman of the Coalition for Justice and Education in Rochester. Um, my testimony, I have 10 myths uh, surrounding the Common Core in education that I'd like to explain to you, but given the time, I've chosen three that I'm going to ad lib on, and uh, hopefully that'll cut down on the time here. First one, <clears throat> for the most part, deals with something that I'm sure you've all heard of uh, a great deal of, uh, and that's that our kids are scoring very poorly on international tests. And that that is the reason that we need Common Core in order to have kids be more prepared for economic competitiveness. The truth is, the reality is that there's no relationship between the international test scores and that of economic success or growth of any country. There's no rhyme or reason for that if you look at it in terms of what happened with both the Reagan years and the Clinton years when we were scoring very poorly on the test, but yet the economy was very successful. The same thing is true for Japan in the late 90s and early 2000s, where their economy was very low, but yet at the same time, they were scoring very high on the test. So the problem is not stupidity, it's not ignorance, it's not a, a horrible education system. The problem is that if we disaggregate the 25% poverty-stricken students in the United States from those tests were at the top. It's an issue of focusing on poverty and trying to increase the quality of education and the ability of kids to engage who suffer from the effects of poverty. Um, what we have as a result of this is that we've got a lot of corporations who are generating hysteria about this and uh, causing, I think, a great number of school districts and people to uh, jump into this bandwagon of Common Core and other ways, whether it's charter schools or whether it's APPR, that somehow we've got to boost test scores in order to increase our education uh, ability. And it's simply not true. Um, the second myth is that Common Core, in terms of its development, followed all the principles of, the, of effective organizational change. You hear this from the commissioner, you'll hear it from a number of state ed officials. And what it boils down to is that uh, the stakeholders, the practitioners, the teachers, the principals, the curriculum ex ex experts, the uh, rank and file throughout the country were not involved. In this. They were involved after the fact in which they recruited a few people to say whether or not this met, these were reasonable things. And these were recruited people who actually gave their testimony. There are some who, who refused to, uh, uh, to endorse it as well. Child psychologists, developmental uh, experts uh, have testified that many of these things are developmentally inappropriate. So those people were ignored as well, as well as assessment experts. There was no field testing and no piloting of the curriculum. So it's pretty much, I think, as some people have described, as uh, building an airplane as we're trying to fly it. Uh, the third and last myth that I'll focus on, which I think is probably one of the most important, is that you'll hear the, ex hear the mantra from many uh, state ed officials, uh, leaders in education, including Arnie Duncan, Secretary of Education, that poverty is no excuse. Um, and all the research shows that there's a direct correlation between poverty and how well kids are going to perform on tests, how well they're going to engage in their education, despite the heroes that we hear about, that was written about by Jonathan Kozel, The Shame of the Nation. There are always kids who will exceed that. Maybe one out of ten will, will make it. But the majority aren't going to make it. So the other thing that's important to know about this is by the, by the fact of test standardized test instruction, a good test maker will say basically half the kids are supposed to score above the mean and half the kids are supposed to score below the mean. Now even if you have a lot of test prep that goes on and you get a group of kids from, poor, from a poor area who score well, what do you think is going to happen to the test the following year? 
it's going to be made that much more difficult. And who do you think is going to be at the bottom again? It's doomed unless there's a focus on poverty in terms of what we can do about it. So when you look at it at, at a class and a typical urban teacher teaching 25 kids who have some of the following kinds of, uh, of issues, everywhere from lead poisoning to poor prenatal care, which has a direct correlation in terms of how kids can learn and how well they're going to behave in the classroom, uh, poor nutrition, stress from violent and drug-laden neighborhoods, uh, lack of exposure to books and vocabulary, uh, parenting and supervision, uh, role models that uh, they often don't have. Uh, if you can picture a classroom like that, you know what the results are going to be. It's extremely difficult to get kids to engage since they're often feeding upon one another as well in terms of uh, behavior and expectations. The only solution, as gentleman, first gentleman who uh, taught, who spoke is that we've got to have either a severe reduction in terms of class teacher ratio from that of what currently is 25 or 30 to 1 to maybe 12 to 1. It's going to cost a lot, but that's the only thing that can work in addition to uh, forming a metropolitan school district, which I know for many of you is a kiss of death in terms of politics, but it's probably the best thing that could happen. I think Bill Jansen was right about 15 years ago when he advocated for that. So what are the solutions? Uh, universal pr uh, prenatal care, ongoing lead point testing and prevention, job training, uh, up, to, uh, up to three years in terms of uh, nursing services and counseling for new parents. As I said, the 12 to 1 teacher ratio. Teacher, uh, uh, and this one I have to focus on is that for the regents, I think you ought to introduce legislation to make sure that any new regent who is uh, selected uh, to be a member of the Board of Regents, that they have teacher or psychological uh, training in terms of uh, their background. Um, I think you ought to encourage the resignation of King and the hiring by the regents of someone who supports the kind of policies that most of us have talked about so far. There ought to be a five-year moratorium on Common Core, uh, teacher practitioner involvement in terms of redesigning it, and also field testing and revisions again. And uh, the other thing would be to end the high-stakes testing that we have and use of portfolios in which teachers as professionals can look at individual kids, look at individual standards for kids, and decide how much they've progressed and give that feedback to both the kid and the parents and make it more of a professional professional relationship as opposed to what we have now, which we're turning teachers into technicians. Uh, if we're looking for a high quality pool of teachers to continue to come back into the profession, this is not doing it. This is chasing away. So with that, I hope you also read the other uh, uh, myths that I've, uh, that I've submitted back here. The other thing I'd like to do is to encourage each of you to purchase this book called Reign of Error by Diane Ravitch. Uh, this book, more than any other book, she's the former Undersecretary of Education under George Bush the first, and she made a complete conversion to the kind of things that we've been talking about because of her involvement and her realization that this stuff just doesn't work. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin McGowan. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I don't have a problem being too far away from the microphone height-wise, for sure. Uh, I, I just start out saying, Assemblyman Johns, your eye looks a little bit like, and I'm sorry for that, looks a little bit like a lot of how the educators feel, <laughs> so it's ironic uh, tonight. And Assemblyman Hawley, I would, the only perspective I could give you that would be uh, perfect would be if you're thinking about a change process, think about your experience working with Mike Lover at Genesee Valley Boces, which many of us participated in the time you were there. That type of change process is what we need, not, not what we're into. So if you're looking for a lens to look at it, as think about those experiences. My name is Kevin McGowan. I'm the superintendent of the Brighton Central School District. I'm also president of the Monroe County Council of School Superintendents. And I am very excited to be here, and thank you for taking the time to hear us out. I'm also proud to work with Rachel Rosner, who spoke to you before, and several teachers who will offer input to you today, Bill Baldwin, I know for sure, and Joan Gears. And I mention their names because I'm very proud to uh, support them and what they're going to say to you and express to you 
in that way that we are in this together as parents, as educators, uh, teachers, and administrators sharing many of the same frustrations. I'm fortunate to work as a teammate with a staff of over 600 dedicated people who work tirelessly to support 3,600 students, their families, and our community. Our teachers and administrators are artists in many ways. They take the raw material they are presented with and create incredible works of art. They do so with painstaking attention to detail, commitment, and a special eye towards the beauty of learning. They have and continue to inspire thinkers, innovators, and great citizens who are focused on solving problems, addressing issues, and doing so collaboratively. They are among the very best at their craft. So the reform agenda has presented us with particular challenges. And I would like to mention a few of those to you today and briefly and directly provide a backdrop and a few suggestions that we think might be manageable, realistic, and fair solutions for the situation that we're all in. First on the positive, I agree that not all students in our country and in our state are receiving education that will prepare them for what lies ahead. There is a crisis. I don't think it has been articulated clearly enough. Um, it, some of the blame has been misplaced. I think we need to understand, as many of the speakers have said, there are other issues at play, uh, not necessarily those that educators have necessarily caused in any way. And I agree that we should be doing better for children living in poverty and those who have limited access to the same learning opportunities and experiences that children in more affluent areas have. A common set of rigorous standards is a noble effort aimed at lifting as many boats as possible as quickly as possible, the hope being that more children will be better prepared. I also recognize that there have been uh, an effort, there has been an effort to implement this massive uh, change in policy perhaps quickly for fear that a meaningful, longer lasting change process would uh, be stalled and perhaps not be successful because there would be so many obstacles in the way. The common core standards are generally pretty good. They resemble great work being done by many educators in high performing districts. It's hard to argue with a high bar that I think will help level the playing field for many children while developing more critical thinkers who are able to analyze and problem solve in different ways and perhaps at a deeper level. It would have made sense to implement a curriculum that had been provided to educators with more time for feedback and eventual adjustment, then provide resources for implementation, then implement an assessment that could fairly evaluate one's success in implementing that curriculum, and if it was really needed, then implement a system for the evaluation of the individuals most directly responsible for implementing that system. Instead, a set of standards were rushed into schools without enough time or resources for meaningful implementation. A set of tests were given to assess a curriculum that hadn't been implemented with full knowledge that children as young as eight years old would be taking tests that they were likely to fail. That was laid out pretty clearly before the tests were given that the results were pretty bad. Yes, we gave a test to small children that we knew they would be unsuccessful in passing. Who does that to children? So to, so to raise the bar and push the system, small children were, were put into a situation we knew they would be unsuccessful. Simultaneously, we were required to negotiate and then implement a system for evaluation that required measuring many teacher success, at least in part based on the poor testing, based on poor implementation, and it didn't do a lot for credibility in the system to say the least. So I offer the following suggestions and additional thoughts. Common Core is generally good, as I mentioned, but I would suggest that the state take a make a much better effort to modify where necessary so as to not lose the artistry of teachers in the classroom and opportunities for creativity and innovation. Convene groups of teachers, administrators, and researchers who can collaboratively and intelligently modify the standard as needed. Not lower the standard, but improve the standard. Reduce state test sessions, the time taken for tests, and the number of sample questions in the assessment. Place sample questions at the end of the test so that fatigue only impacts the research, not a student's score. Right now, those questions are throughout the assessment. Continue to encourage the department to look for waivers from federal requirements so that, so that assessments make more sense for children with special needs or in cases like eighth grade math where they are applying for a waiver so that students won't be double tested. Those are the types of solutions we really need to look at at this point. Require the state to, to provide timely and transparent assessment results. Allow us to see individual test booklets and their scoring so teachers can actually use the data to inform their practice. It could be meaningful. We don't have access to that type of information. Place a moratorium on the use of all test data in teacher evaluations until such time as the state assessments can be shown to be a valid and reliable measure and until a transparent formula 
can be developed to fairly account for the mitigating circumstances that impact student performance and are out of the teacher's control. Engineer flexibility for when districts are achieving that high level. Do not push everyone to the middle. Allow for those who exceed expectations to push themselves farther and in different ways. This allows for diversity in the system and opportunities for students and teachers who have demonstrated success to take a next step toward solving problems instead of just complying. Require the state education department, please, please, to work with school districts to communicate in a timely and clear fashion and to provide support as opposed to just requiring compliance. Finally, we need help. We're here today because we care deeply about this work because we recognize the impact that our work has in the future for children and the communities that we live in. We are actually grateful that there is such a dialogue happening. We just need help. We need resources. We need passion. We need courage. We need children and families supported through greater access to health care, nutritional programs, and mental health support. We can't do it alone, and we are grateful for any partners who want to take on these challenges that will help children in our communities. So thank you. Lisa Button. Lisa Button. Lisa, are you here? She's not here. Thank you. Uh, Candace Rubin. Candace? Oh, there she is. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi. I'm a teacher and a parent. And I wanted to speak specifically to two aspects about Common Core that are uh, deep concern to me. Um, I'm sure that you've seen many of the, or you're familiar with the anecdotal information that's going around on the internet about the psychologist who attacked Common Core as being develop developmentally inappropriate. Um, but I also wanted to speak to the issue of the um, ways in which Common Core will almost inevitably widen the achievement gap between upper middle class students and uh, students who are working class or poor. Um, as we know, um, the, as, as we've developed as a meritocracy, the upper middle class has taken advantage of many opportunities for advancing their children's opportunities. Um, private tutors, um, Sylvan learning services, the many um, many supplements to traditional instruction. Um, I was speaking to my uh, doctor not too long ago and she told me she, she has an MD from McGill. Uh, but she was perplexed on a third grade Common Core math problem that her child brought home from school. Uh, but she spent the time and she researched it and they got the answer together. Um, however, this certainly gives an advantage to two parent families, gives an advantage to um, parents who will marshal every resource for the success of their children. Um, how are you going to, what's going to happen with families in which there is one parent, um, in which there are fewer opportunities for um, augmenting their instruction with, uh, with again, with, with the many resources that, uh, that upper middle class parents have at their disposal. Um, the other aspect that I wanted to speak to um, was the a diminished role of fiction in the Common Core curriculum. Uh, scientists really recently um, did, a, did a research study with Emmanuel Castano and David Comer Kidd. Um, and it uh, was summarized in an October 4th piece in the New York Times called For Better Social Skills, Scientists Recommend a Little Checkoff. And um, they discovered that, of course, reading fiction imp improves the ability to feel empathy and develop coping mechanisms. Um, it extends, um, extends understanding of human motives. And um, under the Common Core, fiction is now restricted. And as an, as an English and social studies teacher, I've enjoyed taking students on the spiritual journey that's represented by extended works of literature. And now that's increasingly being taken away. I've enjoyed uh, doing To Kill a Mockingbird, Their Eyes Are Watching God, um, things that will leave students with lifelong memories. So as a teacher, of course, I believe in showing and not telling. So I'm going to read a piece from um, the 12th grade English module that was, that's by the Buddha. 
and um, I would request that you consider, as I, I'm just going to read a page of this, and in terms of the level, the opportunities for student engagement, um, you know, I would, would direct you to think about this. So I'll start here. The thirst of a thoughtless man grows like a creeper. He runs from life to life like a monkey seeking fruit in the forest. Whomsoever this fierce thirst overcomes, full of poison in this world, has his sufferings increased like the abounding barana grass. He who overcomes this fierce thirst, difficult to be conquered in this world, sufferings fall off from him like water drops from a lotus leaf. The salutary word I tell you, do ye as many as are here assembled, dig up the root of thirst, as he who wants a sweet-scented usaira root must dig up the barana grass, that Mara may not crush you again and again as a stream crushes the reed. As a tree, even though it has been cut down, is firm so long as its root is safe and grows again, thus, unless the feeders of thirst are destroyed, the pain of life will return again and again. He whose thirst running towards pleasure is exceeding strong in the 36 channels, the waves will carry away that misguided man vis his desires which are set on passion. The channels run everywhere. The creeper of passion stands sprouting. If you see the creeper springing up, cut its roots by means of knowledge. Okay, <clears throat> Teachers are moving increasingly, have been before the Common Core, in the direction of understanding that students gain most from work that's culturally relevant. This would be relevant maybe to a student who's done an Asian tour. <laughs> uh, and work that builds on students' background knowledge. And I would tell you that this, for students who had the traditional 11th grade curriculum last year, are basically um, oriented towards the English regions. To be hit with this in their senior year, it's going to mean that some kids don't graduate. Not in this work specifically, but in, you know, the, they're all of the same of these modules. Um, so I would just request that um, the, this quick phase in of Common Core, the Common Core needs some serious uh, reconsideration. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy Santor Molter. Thank you. I'm also prepared for five minutes. Um, I'm an early, early learning specialist with over 40 years experience working directly with children as well as with parents and with teachers in their classrooms. My issue is the Engage New York module, not the Common Core. And I'd like to share some simple but very important facts. My specific focus is kindergarten, as was Jackie. Kindergarten is the most important grade of formal education next to pre-K. All children don't get to attend pre-K. In their case, kindergarten is the most important. The foundation for the next 12 years, it sets the initial tone of the school experience and the kids' attitudes about learning are formed in this important first year. Yet, we constantly disregard and disrespect that fact. Even without Common Core and, and Engage New York, we all need to seek up to oppose 25 kids in the kindergarten class. Even with an additional adult, 25 kids per classroom in this foundation year is too many for the rich, deep learning Common Core and Engage New York now, added to too many children with one teacher in kindergarten, which also promotes behavior issues and negatively affects the learning environment, our children and our kindergarten teachers are burdened with an English language arts curriculum, the Engage New York module, that are not engaging for four, five, and six year olds. The scripts within the modules offer lots of telling of information by the teacher. By my standards of developmentally appropriate and my years of experience in early childhood classrooms, these scripts are not emotionally engaging or physically engaging. Kids who are emotionally and physically engaged learn. Those who are not emotionally or physically engaged not only don't learn well, but behavior issues erupt. I will come back to behavior. For kindergartners to learn, they need to use their curiosity and their imagination to be excited to learn, to have wonderful fiction, and they need to use their bodies to move. That's how learning works for four and five-year-olds. 
That's what we call developmentally appropriate. Not sitting facing a smart board that displays eight or ten pictures over a period of 50 minutes while the teacher reads from a script. The implementation strategies of these models, the script and the pacing, seem to not take into account anything related to the appropriateness of play, curiosity, imagination, and movement. All things the child development specialists know and have known for years. Five-year-olds do not need to learn how to read or to be forced to write. This, is, this all started 20 years ago, the attempt to push second grade curriculum into kindergarten. Too many boys are learning to hate school at this young age. From our brain research, we know the brains of children, four, five, and six, particularly boys, are not wired to be using the language areas of their brain required to learn to read. And we know that boys especially need to move a lot or they get in trouble. Their brains are not yet wired to be still and quiet. They can learn to listen while they're moving. When children aren't engaged, they start moving, and then they are admonished to behave. The anxiety caused by this and the stress of inappropriate strategies and inappropriate, irrelevant content lead to the buildup of a chemical called cortisol. We know that when brains and bodies are full of cortisol, even our own, they, we lose the ability to focus, Children lose the ability to sustain interest, to remember, and ultimately, with too much stress and cortisol, they, they lose their ability to learn in the classroom. This is a scientific fact, one we need to apply to the formal education of our youngest children. Common Core is not our biggest issue. The Engage New York modules are the issue, specifically the implementation of these scripted pace out modules that teachers, I'm sorry, <laughs> that teachers understand they are required to use. The New York State Education Department from John King down has made it very clear that this is not the case. The requirement is not coming from the state. They are very clear that the Engaged New York modules are a guide only and cannot be mandated by the state. In the meantime, our teachers, including our very best, have been intimidated into believing they must use the Engage New York modules to meet the Common Core standards. And thus, and in order to avoid being penalized due to evaluations and test results, how demeaning for a highly effective teacher to be told she or he is a developing teacher and may be demoted within three years or worse. We need our administrators to recognize this and to recognize the wisdom of these early childhood educators who know what is appropriate for their children, and it's not Engage New York. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Jennifer, is it Seth? Yeah. Jennifer, are you here? Jennifer, one last time. Once. Right. How about Cindy Keller? Good afternoon, and thank you for having this forum and allowing us the opportunity to share um, with you. As you can see, we're, there's a um, lot of very passionate um, people around these issues, and uh, we're glad to have the opportunity to be able to share it this afternoon. So I'm speaking to you this evening with three hats. Um, one is a parent of middle school and high school students. Um, second is a middle school mathematics teacher. And third is a professor at the University of Rochester, working as the co-director of the Warner Center for Professional Development and Education Reform, and the executive director of the Mathematics Outreach Division. My colleagues and I have been active in mathematics education, promoting high quality mathematics instruction, working with dozens of districts locally, and have been involved at the state and national level for over 20 years. My comments this evening relate primarily to the Common Core Standards in Mathematics and their implementation. 
Our message is about the need for clarity as we articulate our concerns. We need to be very clear about what we as leaders in New York State want to take on and what change we want to affect. As we have listened to teachers, parents, students, administrators, and the media discussion, we have noted that most of the public outcry about the Common Core Standards is a confusion or muddling of the issues. Many make comments about the standards. My youngest son even came home last week and commented, I don't really like these Common Core Standards. But often the reality is that they are talking about other related issues. Issues such as challenges related to the immediate implementation of the Common Core in grades 3, 8 in New York State and then algebra this year. The curriculum materials being used to implement the standards, such as the modules developed by a contract with New York State. Third, assessments developed by Pearson for New York State, measuring students' learning of the standards. And fourth, New York State's APPR implementation, measuring teacher effectiveness using these scores. If you actually made a tally chart this evening with these five categories, standards, implementation, curriculum, assessment, and teacher evaluation, you could record where speakers' concerns lie. And very few lie with the standards themselves. So in terms of the standards, conceptually, we believe that the Common Core State Standards are not necessarily a bad thing. As a matter of fact, they have the potential to be a very good thing for students in New York State. The Common Core Standards for Mathematics Content and Practices call for instruction to support students in developing understanding, procedural fluency, critical thinking, and problem solving. They were written based on available research and benchmarked against expectations of high-performing countries. For New York State, moving from the 2005 standards in mathematics to the Common Core is actually a big step forward. The 2005 math standards, written by a relatively small group of educators in a short time frame, did not require our students to build conceptual and procedural understandings. While we might have felt some comfort in our students' test scores rising, this was primarily due to the, um, the ability to predict what was going to be on the test. If we look at um, other tests, such as the NAEP, New York State scores actually continue to decline. So that being said, the Common Core standards are not perfect. The authors have said that the standards should be seen as a living document and should continue to reflect the lessons that we learn about mathematics, teaching, and learning. However, on the second point of clarity, there are some serious and detrimental issues for our children and teachers in New York State related to the implementation of these standards. Out of all 45 states and two territories that have adopted the Common Core Standards, only New York, Kentucky, and West Virginia have forged ahead implementing the standards and assessments. Other states, such, such as Georgia, Delaware, and Utah, have spent time educating their stakeholders including extensive professional development and developing resources to support teachers as they move from one set of standards to another. Other states, such as Pennsylvania, phased in their implementation, first implementing K-2 and then 3-5. These states have been responsive to the difficulties of making this shift and have responded, asking for waivers and making revisions to their original plans outlined in the Race to the Top funding. A third point of, of clarity, curriculum. One of the ways that New York State Ed has said that they're supporting the immediate implementation of the Common Core is to provide optional curriculum, which they call modules. The company that received the multi-million dollar contract from our New York State taxpayer dollars is called Common Core Inc., a name that they have had for over a decade. Didn't they get just lucky? <laughs> Common Core Inc. has developed these mathematics modules and ELA, but over a very short period of time. Where um, whereas curriculum takes years to write and field test. There is significant confusion between the standards and the interpretation of the standards written in these modules, not the least of which is the name. These modules are written by a company very quickly, are not completed, and are one interpretation. They are not the standards. And then there's assessment. Similar to its curriculum development, New York State has forged ahead with creating its own assessments via contracts with Pearson to assess national standards, which national experts in the field are working on in Park and Smarter Balance. Other states have been piloting and field testing new assessments, rather than New York State implementing actual assessment and field test items at the same time, as Dr. McGowan spoke about. 
Again, let's look at how others are implementing assessment. Florida, Oregon, and California are blending assessments, waiting for national assessments to be operational and requesting waivers, and proposing moratoriums on testing. The Common Core Standards provide the opportunity to collaborate nationally and learn from the work of others. It is time for New York to stop working in isolation, to stop thinking that being first is the same as being best. As a community, we need to be clear that it is not necessarily about fighting the standards. They have not been implemented or assessed in a way that we can begin to determine their effectiveness in terms of mathematical learning, but to propose a revised implementation and assessment plan and apply for variances at the national level that would allow teachers and students in this transition to be unharmed and at the same time allow us to support students and teachers, draw on national resources and learnings, and collect and analyze data to determine what works, not to jump into immediate and abrupt imp implementation tied to evaluation policies that harm students and teachers. Dina Strasser. Dina, are you here? One last time, Dina Strasser. Uh, Slow, Engler. It's actually Flow. Sorry about that. That's okay. I'll forgive you. Um, Mr. No. my staff. They're real slow. Well, you know, I mean, really, could you imagine naming your child slow? Yes, I could, actually. <laughs> it is possible. Um, Mr. Nojay, uh, Shannon Joy wanted me to give you a shout out for finally seeing the light. <laughs> And I apologize. Um, I'm going to blow my time limit. I'm Italian. We like to talk. We get you know, we digress. So I apologize. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to share our thoughts and concerns with you about Common Core. It's a shame that these conversations didn't happen prior to the adoption of Common Core by Governor Cuomo and Commissioner King. I suppose I should con also confess that I am a white suburban soccer mom who definitely believes that her children are brilliant, contrary to our out-of-touch leaders in education. The only special interest group I belong to is that of my children. I am also an educated, I'm also educated and uh, I pay school and corporate taxes in the state. I brought my son with me tonight. He's nine and a half. I brought him here um, as a teaching moment to show him how great our country is and how the political process works and how we can speak out and, and hopefully we're, you listen. Um, I also brought him out because he, he's interested in also sharing some things with you as well. But I think when we talk here in, in these forums, we forget that it's about them. Gabriel is my very special interest. He's twice exceptional. That means that he's both gifted and also has learning challenges. These are the very children that are falling through the cracks. They were falling through the cracks before, and they're going to fall through the cracks now. My son started uh, Common Core, specifically in math, in 2010. So started his disdain for school. Can you imagine hating school in second grade? By third grade, he was um, so filled with anxiety that he was pulling the hair from his head. He actually lost a quarter of an inch of hair on his hairline because he wasn't getting the help, his teachers weren't trained, and he just they just kept pushing him along. I'm not here to share statistics with you. I will leave that to my cohorts that are much more well-versed on the topic. What I hope for is that you might consider for a moment how this, is, this mandated curriculum impacts our students, teachers, and families. I've watched the change in teachers and students over the years, and it's really sad. The first point I would like to make, and I won't spend a lot of time, is that it is developmentally inappropriate. Now consider that when you take into account that my youngest is on the autism spectrum. 
and also has many other challenges aside from that to her learning profile. According to Mary Kalamia, we are asking children to write critically using emotionally charged language to persuade rather than inform. So when we are asking young children to use emotionally charged language, we are actually asking them to fuel their persuasiveness with fear and anger. They are not capable of the judgment required to temper this with reason and logic. It seems we've abandoned the innovative teaching and instead teach to the tests. The dreaded exams that students, parents, and teachers were left in a complete state of anxiety in last year. These tests do not measure learning. What they really measure is endurance and resilience. Only a child that can sit and focus for 90 minutes can succeed. The high stakes testing that is part of Race to the Top and Common Core package deal is quite harmful to students. There are some teachers that will be reluctant to have AIS, ESL, 504, and IEP students in their classes. Teachers are quite concerned with the, the large percentage of APPR score tied to, being tied to factors that they cannot control. This makes me very sad, since my children's potential may not always be measured by a test. What will happen when there's no special ed teachers? Common Core does not embrace educating the whole child, which, which include social and emotional learning. Research shows that children perform better academically when they feel safe. Common Core one-size-fits-all approach goes against the very grain of how some children learn. Testing times have increased 163% since 2010, and that doesn't include the prep time for the testing. Common Core discriminates against my children with IEPs and 504s because of its rigidity. It denies every New York, New York State special ed 504 student their rights to faith. It ignores how and what their brains may be wired to actually accomplish academically. Why are children who are delayed in reading, a year or two behind their peers, and have IEPs required to take the same level of test and are not offered a different assessment. <clears throat> what special education professional with ample experience had any part of math or ELA Common Core documentation? You can refer to the New York State Common Core for ELA Math on, on NYSED's website, and the term special needs is used exactly twice in each document. There is zero reference to the term IEP or individualized education plan. We used to track students voca into vocational, IEP, regents, honors programs. Now there is one track, pass or fail. If you can't pass these high stake tests, if you're not college ready, co college capable, then you don't get a diploma. What in your opinion do you think happens to a child's self-esteem when they're not even getting a diploma? Or how will, it, how will that affect graduation rates? Do you honestly think that children will be motivated to stay in school for a certificate? A pat on the shoulder? Gee, thank you for, for your participation. I do not believe that our education system was so broken. How is it possible that spending has outpaced the results, the results of education so incredibly? I'm infuriated to hear that all of the ungodly money that our government has taxed us for education and misused is now telling the public that our education system is broken. We've had four curriculum changes in 15 years. Four. And now we have Common Core. How do we know what's up and what's down? Has anyone ever considered the idea of improving the flawed No Child Left Behind law, which didn't allow for student failure? I have known 10th grade students four and five years behind in reading. How do you think they could possibly be ready for college if they just keep getting passed along? The problem with Common Core is not just bad implementation. There is more to the core. It is rigid and its one-size-fits-all approach will leave many students like Gabriel to fall in the cracks. I despise the term cradle to the grave tracking of my children's personal data and that we have not been given a choice to opt out. Parents are assaulted at every turn these days. If we are not being insulted by the likes of Mr. Duncan, our rights are being stripped away little by little, as we have seen in FERPA and even in the proposed UN disability rights. As we know, our children's records are no longer fully protected as FERPA, as, as it's being Swiss cheese by Common Core. According to InBloom website, they are actively collecting 400 data points for each student. Districts receiving the Race to the Top monies are being forced to select a data dashboard from an SED-approved list. 
I listened to today's hearing in the assembly. I, it was most eye-opening and even more startling to truly realize John King's lack of understanding or flat-out dishonesty of the exchange of our children's data. I am disgusted that the rights we once had under FERPA were changed in the dark of night without any public knowledge, coincidentally, a few years before Common Core was, was rolled out. If you all think we are so ignorant to the fact that Common Core was initiated on a federal level, you're mistaken. Common Core contradicts the laws of IDEA and ADA and forces my children to adapt to a curriculum rather than the curriculum being adapted for them to meet their individual needs. I do not send my children to school to become angry and demoralized. There is no respect for parents in this process. We've been insulted time and time again and excluded from the process completely and treated as if we, can't, we are incapable of making decisions on our own lives, even down to the health care that we have. There's no dignity for our teachers. Do we need a better way to evaluate teachers? Yes. But demoralizing and holding them to those standards without the proper supports in place is not the way to go about it. Lastly, and most importantly, our children deserve respect and protection. Our children are your children, too. You see how we parents, taxpayers, and voters have mobilized to bring our concerns to you. So the question I leave with you tonight is, do you stand with the establishment or with the white suburban soccer moms that will be sure to exercise their rights at the voting booth next election? When I was in second grade, every night when I came home, I used to cry and scream my lungs out before I did my homework. Yeah. My name is Gabriel. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Paul. Julie Mitchell. Good evening. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be heard. A special thank you to Assemblyman Mark Johns, who met with me in a small delegation last spring to receive a petition of 1,100 signatures calling for New York State to separate our ties with the Federal Race to the Top initiative. Allow me to begin with a thought-provoking statement. Packaging matters. I teach in Fairport while I reside in Webster. I am 43 years old and a 17-year veteran educator teaching high school English in both central and western New York. I am public school educated and from a union family of educators. My husband and I are proud parents of a five-year-old son in kindergarten at the Webster Montessori School. Yes, there it is, I've said it. I am living and breathing hypocrisy. But I am a mommy, I can take it. My son will not be common cord on my watch. And I seemingly fight every day for my public school students, whom I constantly refer to as my kids. Again, allow me to remind you, packaging matters. Common core and excessive standardized testing have been framed by the rhetoric of fear and packaged as a panacea to mold every public school student in America into college and career ready material. In other words, vessels filled with and robots of data. The very foundation of this country is crumbling and quickly because our public schools, its teachers and staff and students, are failures according to the loudest voices of those well rehearsed in manipulating panic with and for the almighty dollar. New York State's graduation rate is at approximately 74%, a percentage not defined with any context, a percentage that is devastating, we're told, as our students will be hindered from globally competing. Competing? First of all, how about eating? To me, this statistic speaks volumes about unacceptable rates of and conditions of much more than graduation rates. The value of our youngest New Yorkers, 
poverty, health care, mental health and wellness, nutrition, family support and love, and quality public education. Meanwhile, underneath the layers and layers of packaging the urgency of the Common Core and its numerous tests, the effects of this so-called reform movement are already multifaceted and overwhelmingly destructive. I am confident the testimonies of elementary teachers and parents of elementary students we've heard here this evening concerning the physical and emotional toll on New York's children from this excessive testing and inappropriate expectations have been and will continue to be heard. I would like to give voice to similar distresses being realized by our secondary students and, our by, and by our profession as a whole. Number one, many districts similar to where I am fortunate to have built my career currently maintain a graduation rate of 98 to 100 percent. Why are we fixing what isn't broken? Number two, 13 years ago, my 10th grade honors English classes and I enjoyed our journey through 10 to 14 novels enhanced by analytical writing and literary criticism. Today, our trek is limited to about eight novels and convoluted by detours with four additional assessments that are quite frankly distractions. Number three, resources, programming, and support have been decimated. Public school student populations and demographics are drastically restructuring. We are losing students to homeschool environments and private school opportunities at an alarming rate. Number four, morale is destructively low. School is no longer fun. There is simply no time and no room for empathy and compassion. Teachers and students find themselves overwhelmed by the absurdity of being rewarded for uniformity and penalized for creativity. Please remember, packaging matters. Like so many, I was educated and mentored here in New York State. Trust in what we have created and nurtured. I just want to teach. Please, just let me teach. Trust in me to teach, first and foremost, with my heart. Remove the layers and layers of lies, developmentally inappropriate standards, and disparaging assessments before we destroy one more New York public school student's love of lifelong learning. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Jack Kendrick. Jack Kendrick. Did I get that right, Ken? Or Jack, I'm sorry. sorry. Jack. Okay. I'm, I'm getting uh, a couple of those today. Yeah. Uh, my, my name is Jack Langerak. And uh, I am a retired English and theater teacher from Penfield and have continued my involvement in education as a consultant in the field of arts and education and as uh, currently a, a supervisor of student teachers for Nazareth College. I agree with everyone about the concern that uh, Common Core raises about what is going on with our children. But I would like to speak with you about what all of the crazy approaches currently on the educational scene are doing to a profession I love, which is the teaching profession. The regulations now in place to measure teacher effectiveness on the basis of student test scores is a not so subtle way of telling the teachers of New York State that they are under suspicion. Thousands and thousands of hardworking, dedicated, self-sacrificing, not to mention underpaid teachers across our state are experiencing a degradation of their expertise and are being made to feel that society in general is blaming them for the lack of results. The Common Core standards are being taught through a series of complete learning units, modules they are called. These stipulates what, uh, stipulate what the students read, what is handed out, what visuals are shared, and even what the teachers need to say. 
These have taken the lesson planning out of the hands of the teachers. There is an abhorrent term connected to the undercurrent generated by these modules. They are said to be teacher-proof, a term that is a slap in the face of every caring and fully capable professional educator. It suggests that anyone can come into a classroom, be given a module, and teach a lesson. We know that many factors contribute to students' academic performance, including individual characteristics and family and neighborhood experiences. But research suggests that among school-related factors, teachers matter most. But as a result of these modules, the local control of curriculum is removed. And instead, classrooms are controlled far away from the local school community by the state and the corporations from whom these lessons were purchased. The Common Core Standards and their modules are far too frequently and damagingly developmentally inappropriate for the learners. Students are eager to be successful, and their learning needs to be nurtured by one success building on another. When great developmental gaps exist, and the state insists that teachers move on to dig into material that leaps well beyond the student's prior learning, great frustrations, anxieties, and disappointments build, and these are significantly damaging to our learners. Teachers may disagree with these approaches, and yet their students will more than likely be tested on materials featured in these modules. What are they to do? As a result of the current climate in education, more and more valued teachers are looking for the first opportunity to get out. Young people who are considering careers as teachers are being discouraged, sometimes by teachers themselves. Enrollment in teacher education programs in colleges and universities around our state and country is in sharp decline. The Common Core state standards are continuing the degradation of schools into test preparation centers, continuing the narrowing of curriculum, and continuing the dampening of the joy of learning. Instead of all this, let's replicate the now somewhat isolated models of schooling that have regularly demonstrated success. Let's get back to the locally designed lessons that open up the curriculum to engage students in inquiry, in the arts, and in project-based learning, and in a variety of ways to demonstrate their success. These are approaches rich with statistical proof that they improve literacy and math, that diverse learners make significant gains, that they enhance the learning environment, and that they increase student motivation to learn. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Elizabeth Bingham. Elizabeth Bingham. Good evening. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity for us to stand in front of you. My name is Beth Bingham. I'm a mother of two daughters, both raised in the public school system. I'm also a child care provider, early childhood development student for life, because I don't think you can ever learn enough about child development. I'm an advocate for developmentally appropriate practice with young children, and that's what I'm going to address with you tonight. As I'm sure you're discovering, people involved in testing the current Common Core program are from all demographics and are advocating for thousands of different reasons. This said, I found the anti-Common Core approach to be united through three different things. One, we all want productive progression in the American public school system. Two, we're all motivated out of the need for developmentally appropriate and humane practice with all children and their teachers. And three, our approach is supported solely through facts and research. <clears throat> there are mountains of vetted research about best practices and how children learn and develop. This common core system takes all of this research and proven practice and throws it out the window. All the positive evolution of understanding benefits of inclusion, differentiated instruction, multiple intelligences, the value of play, 
the value of portfolio assessment, anti-bullying, humiliation policies, all of these are being sacrificed on the altar of untested, unproven, invalidated common core, which strives to privatize and profit off from our children. I have to say that's not my quote. That was a quote I got from a friend. <laughs> early childhood includes the period from newborn through eight years old. In the early childhood brain, scaffolds of understanding and concept building are being constructed at an alarming rate. These constructed webs become the pathways upon which future of education and information down, you know, years down the road um, travel and become absorbed as knowledge. This entire infrastructure is developed based mostly on children's interaction with their world or based on play. Healthy development of this infrastructure requires uninhibited play. Uninhibited play is child-directed exploration. They're following their individual processes of interest and curiosity. Basic Brain Development 101. When five-year-old Jacob builds slot structure, he's building the foundation of ge geometry in his understanding. When four-year-old Gracie retreats to the sand table in the busy classroom, she's learning emotional regulation. When six-year-old Logan is supposed to do forced to do three worksheets of homework each night. Kindergarten, Logan. Three worksheets of homework every night. After a full day of paperwork in class, no time for any play. Reduced gym time due to the need to conquer this paperwork. And then he's disciplined for his developmentally appropriate six-year-old behavior on the bus. What is he learning? In her article, Reclaiming Play, Helping Children Learn and Thrive in School, Nancy Carlson Page states, one of the most important things we can do to help children build an understanding of concepts that we want them to learn in school is to provide them with long blocks of time that allow them to get deeply engrossed in their play. We can maximize learning by providing open-ended materials, such as blocks, Play-Doh, building and collage materials, generic dolls, animals. These are the materials that foster extended play and build new learning. I implore you to go and visit a kindergarten, first grade, or second grade classroom in which these activities and experiences are so vital in these children's development. You will not find them. You'll find the children in developmentally inappropriate expectations, such as sitting at desks for long periods of time. Their days being stripped of physical play, free play, or any play. You'll also find higher behavior outbursts, less self-control, clinically diagnosed emotional conditions. Practices of what used to be implemented in the third and fourth grade classes, where children's brains have already mastered much of the needed infrastructure through play and were developmentally able, able to perform these expectations, these things are now being pushed down into the kindergarten first and second grade. In Education Week teacher article titled Common Core Standards, 10 Colossal Errors, Anthony Cody writes, no experts on early childhood were included in the drafting or internal review of the Common Core. In response to the Common Core, more than 500 experts, early childhood development experts, signed the joint statement of early childhood health and education professionals on Common Core Standards Institute. Um, and I have put that into your packets. You can all look that up if you haven't heard of it. The statement now seems prophetic in light of what is happening in our classroom. The key concerns they raised were standards will lead to long hours of instru instruction in literacy and math. They'll lead to inappropriate standardized testing. District instruction and testing will crowd out other important areas of learning. And there's little event evidence that such standards for young children lead to later success. In the article, Early Learning, This Is Not a Test, Randy Winter Green and Nancy Carlson Page state, standards for early childhood education, including the Common Core State Standards, 
must reflect the decades of research in cognitive and developmental psychology and neuroscience that tells us how young children learn. They just develop skills over time through a process of building ideas. This process isn't always linear, and it's not quantifiable. Expecting young children to know specific facts or skills at specific ages is not compatible with how they learn. It emphasizes right and wrong answers instead of developmental progressions that typify their learning. Why did our nation, our state, our educational leaders not take these vastly available child development and educational experts in research data into account before so hastily implementing such a damaging program on our children. In closing, I want to share with you an observation a friend made at the Syracuse Forum that was just posted um, this past Monday evening. She said there was an order of those who spoke. The order was superintendents and administrators first, then business associates representatives, then teachers, then parents. The further you got from the powers that be, the more anti-common core you got. In other words, the people who are close to the kids and are witnessing what is going on on a daily basis want to see this monstrosity end. The higher-ups are just out of touch. Global preparedness and career in college ready have become tired old taglines of the common core as the movement to stop common core brings back research and data to the table. Those out of touch bring the same old, same old, along with some pretty cold and unprofessional attitude. Commissioner King and Arne Duncan have repeatedly disregarded parental priority, as well as children's rights. Parents are children's most important teachers and most important decision makers, of which is and should always be protected by law. We have listened We've listened to the mental health professionals as they tend to an increasing number of children with depression, anxiety, and behavioral outbursts, and they now coin the phrase common core syndrome. We have listened to the research data that tells us much of what is being implemented into the early childhood learning environment is not only developmentally inappropriate, but it's developmentally damaging. We have listened to the teachers as they forced as they are forced to use this unresearched program of extremely poor quality, disregarding their years of professional development, their unique and creative implementation of teaching alternatives and personal connection with their students. And we have listened to our children as we rock them at night and assure them that they are capable. They are loved. And their future is their choice, not this organization. We will not stop until they are all heard and appropriate action is taken to put America and New York's public education system on the right track. Thank you. Jay Shipley. Jay Shipley. Hi. I'm going to try to be respectful of everybody's time here tonight. Um, I prepared for five minutes. I'm going to try to cut it down. Um, I just I prepared some quick facts there accessible to you in my written statements. Um, you know, I think we're all aware that this was done by uh, the federal level, a couple of small closed door operations, only 29 individuals on a validation board, five of which wouldn't approve the standards. Um, their dissent was removed from the official reports. Um, you know, the, the chancellor of our board of regents is an independently wealthy billionaire who finances the fellowship board who implements this in our state with a $1 million grant, so the Gates Foundation nearly a million dollars. So we know how this got here. Um, Pearson Education was awarded the five-year, $33 million contract following a subpoena from State Attorney, Attorney General Eric Schneiderman regarding why our, our previous New York State Commissioner of Education was being flown out of the country and given swag bags uh, in order to uh, attend their rallies and or conferences. 
and then sign the contract directly after that. So um, Pearson is, is a business. They're run like a business. What they need to do is they need to lobby. Um, their lobbying went from $100,000 in 2006 to $1.2 million in 2012. Um, that's in direct correlation with the development of the Common Core Standards. So we've heard people up here say, well, those standards, are, uh, they're good in concepts, but they have all these other things attached to them. If you understand how a business works, those other things are not going away. Uh, there's a lot of money to make sure that those stay attached, which includes the uh, Enga Engage New York website. Um, my background, I teach in a public school. I have an MBA in finance. Um, I've worked in mortgage finance and health insurance underwriting before I went into public education. I know how corporations work. I know how private business works. Uh, I'm a registered conservative, and I appreciate talking to you gentlemen here tonight about this. Um, I've worked with data before. And everything that I'm told about decision making with our kids is data. Um, I know my students. I know them because I talk to them. I know them because I ask questions about them. Um, and I ask them questions about how they understand the concepts that we address. We're going to have a whole lot of very well uh, aggregated data and analysis to tell us that our kids that don't care about school don't do well. That's where this is going to take us. Um, so the result of that as a taxpayer, uh, you know, that's concerning. Uh, parents giving up their kids' privacy rights, not being able to opt out of what is collected on their kids and sent to the cloud network that is open source to other app providers is concerning. Um, but at the core root here, uh, reform needs to take place at the family level, and it's a family-oriented process, which education should be. Um, that's really the only, uh, the only opinion that I've got about that. Now, what I prepared in my statements, um, I said children are not common. Free-thinking, free productive individuals are not common. Um, we should seek to inspire individuals to be uncommon. So to impose meaningless constraints upon expression, thought, analysis, and force problem-solving and intellectual exploration into a centrally planned grading rubric is an absurd proposition. To create a system behind closed doors that is in diametric contrast to the recommendations of educational and psychologists is uh, irresponsible, and to usher its implementation by purchasing favor with unelected officials is antithetical to our democratic process. Um, in closing, uh, I, I saw today some research from Stanford University that was backed by the Educational Policy Institute. That research showed that our test scores, we like to compare those with other countries. Those countries don't take all of their kids and test them. They take some of their kids and they track them away because they're not good enough. Uh, we test all of our kids. Um, our scores have shown globally the smallest gap of achievement between high income, well socioeconomic families and low. What we're going to do is explode that gap with Common Core, or we're going to lower the common, I'm sorry, we're going to bring the common denominator down to its lowest point. Um, in the past 20 years, we've seen our high achieving students lower their performance as we have exponentially risen the performance of our lowest socioeconomic class. And uh, I think that this one-size-fits-all approach is not the answer. It fits, it fits a business model, but it doesn't fit our system. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jay. Jeff Crane. Jeff. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, allowing us to participate in this forum. You uh, have received my written testimony, and I was going to read from that. Let me just tell you that the written testimony is the Westerondekoit Central School District answer to the five topics on the invitation. That's uh, what I engaged uh, our answers with. Uh, I am uh, proud to say that uh, I'm only a few years behind Aggie. I have uh, 40 years of experience in education. I'm a Fairport graduate. All four of our kids uh, graduated from Fairport, and I've been lucky enough to work in the Fairport, Brighton, Victor, and West Arondequoit districts in my career. This is my 11th year as superintendent in the West Arondequoit School District, a district where our motto is each child belongs to all of us. Think about that. Think about the power of a phrase like that, and I will acknowledge that I stole it, as all good teachers will do when they hear something good from uh, a wonderful special educator named Mike Wisniewski, who is at St. John Fisher College now, when he used to serve on the Board of Education. And they used to talk about that phrase. And ever since that course, 
We've talked about that in West Ironic Way. Each child belongs to all of us. What does that mean? It goes back to what Aggie mentioned. Teachers know their kids, and we are allowed to serve each child through the differentiation of instruction. The differentiation of instruction is one of the most difficult things for any teacher to do. And the measure of success is the attempt to get to every single one of their kids every single day with what every single one of their kids needs individually. And I have seen over 40 years phenomenal teachers able to not only plan to do that, but to be able to pull it off. I will tell you that in 40 years, I have never worked as hard as I have done in the past two years to protect teachers. Now, you may think that I should be up here saying I should be protecting the kids. If you protect the teacher's ability to teach, to take risks, if a teacher won't take risks, how are we going to allow our kids to take risks? And if they are worried, if they are worried about an unfair system that's going to rate them, then everything that they do is going to be colored by that system. And so I bring to you tonight three ideas that we could do, as all good teachers do, when a lesson plan maybe isn't working that well. They monitor and they adjust. The State Education Department will tell you that we did differentiate, that we have 700 different APPR plans because we negotiated with our local unions. However, they won't say how long it took for the APPR plan to be passed over the phone with folks following a rubric of their own. So we really didn't get to negotiate locally. And I would suggest to you what I've suggested since uh, Senator Flanagan's commission last year, and you have a copy of my letter uh, that indicates uh, my thank you to him for having that forum. Let me just read to you. Please accept this note as a thank you for considering my testimony on Monday, October 22nd, 2012, regarding the 7525 APPR proposal. Again, this would allow for school districts qualified by a proven history of rigorous supervision and high achievement to locally negotiate from the 60-20-20 APR legislation to the 75%, 25% state testing. What I'm saying is, if we do have local control, if that's what folks are going to say, let us negotiate with our unions around the local 20%. I will tell you that if, if that was passed immediately by legislation, there'd be about 20 districts in this area in within a week with memorandum of agreement with their unions to drop the local testing that is part of the 60-20. I'm a realist. I've been doing this a long time. I hope that some of the comments uh, will allow us to work towards better decisioning, but until that happens, let's lower this stress on kids through the teacher stress on this APPR. Let's go with 75% of the rubric and supervisory uh, rigorous feedback loops um, and 25% of whatever state standardized testing because as much as I agree with what I've heard here tonight, I don't think that we're going to get out of standardized testing completely. And if we're working towards that, let's at least lower the stress level on teachers. What will that do? First of all, as I stated uh, a follow-up to my testimony, please know that each bullet on my cover letter reviewed below was intended to address my growing concern that our collaborative efforts designed to improve the education for all students of New York are being undermined. That was last year. You're here because you've seen the results of exactly that prediction. What will the 75-25 concept uh, uh, accomplish? Better inform instructional practice through regular, specific feedback. Differentiated instruction allows teachers to address each student's learning needs just as differentiated implementation of APPR would allow rigorous supervisory programs to continue to achieve at the highest levels with less loss of instructional time. What would the benchmarks be? Someone earlier mentioned 98% graduation levels. Could be advanced designation regents diplomas. It could be a variety of benchmarks that school districts that are already reaching these levels could continue to do their programs that have proven successful. 
It will maximize instruction through the reduction of total numbers and times of student assessments. You may hear from the State Education Department that there's already a waiver system. Well, that waiver system we've already taken advantage of. By virtue of the way we developed our APPR, we were able to limit the number of local exams to under 100. There are districts represented here today that are giving over 1,000 additional local exams, pre- and post-test, because of the 20% local and the way that it was negotiated and the way that they had to get their APPR approved so that they wouldn't lose state aid. Reduce the cost of the APPR mandate. This is last year now. The cost to implement APPR in the Western Ronacoy District so far, October 2012, is over $400,000. 4,300 staff hours spent on APPR, approximately $200,000. State education member said to me, Jeff, you would have been working on professional development anyhow. You would have been spending that money. And I respectfully said, Ken, we would have been talking about instruction, not rating systems and number systems and forcing teachers to look over their shoulders at that. Computer capacity. Do you know that we have to consider keynoting, teaching keynoting to second graders? so that they're ready to sit at the computers and be able to take a test in third grade? Do you know that we have not enough computer capacity in any district in this area, let alone what's happened in every state where all, this, all the school districts have sat down to test at one time? And legal advice, <laughs> approximately $15,000. Two last points. Acknowledge exemplary New York State school system. I had provided 12 pages of documentation about what an exemplary school district might look like. And don't stop there. Don't stop there. Promote partnerships and collaboration between the exemplars and others who may not be at that level. The three bullets that I add to the answer of number two are allow for the local control 7525. Kevin McGowan mentioned earlier field test questions. I'd like our tests to come back to our teachers so they can do an item analysis and inform their instruction. Short of that, because the state education department doesn't have the money to build that many questions into the test every year, short of that, at least, at least let's not force the kids who are the best test takers to stop in the middle of the exam with questions or field test questions that don't. Let's put the field test questions at the end. That's something we, sim we can do very quickly, very easily, right away. We can do that. We can, we can get rid of the local exams through negotiations. And finally, and this is probably the hardest, you could restore the gap elimination monies that we've been losing since the good Governor Patterson used that strategy. That would help us. We are $2.5 million in the hole still as we start our budget season. I know that's probably the hardest one I'm asking you for, but that is something that's very important. Would you have any questions for me as a 40-year veteran before I'm I sit down? down? Because we still have a lot of things to go through. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Bob Zogby. Okay, first of all, timer. Timer. Don't start yet. But I, but I want to thank you for not being overbearing. And Assemblyman, thank you for not cutting us off. I appreciate that as well. My name is Bob Zogby. I'm a retired English teacher at Pittsford Central Schools. I'm here today to not just ask you as a local Assemblyman um, of our state, but to beg you to contest the current way the New York State Education Department assesses our students by fighting to turn all creation of state student assessments back to the local school districts. Reach, research has shown that the current one-size-fits-all assessments are an invalid and inaccurate measure of a student's ability. And Aggie, I'm referring to what you talked with showing the shoes there. It would be like all of us wearing size 13 shoes because the person who sold us the pair said it was perfect for us without us trying it on or making sure it was comfortable. Then, leaving the store, we proceed 
to walk, run, play basketball, shop, continue to do our everyday activity while tripping, losing one or both of your shoes, losing your balance, falling, and eventually giving up wearing the shoes. Then returning to the store, the owner tells us that there are no refunds, no exchanges, and we must wear the shoes. Our children are currently forced to take unsubstantiated and age-inappropriate one-size-fits-all tests that make them feel defeated, stupid, um, frustrated, and inadequate while causing anxiety, school phobia, and physical reactions such as vomiting. Tweaks to the system will not be effective. It must be a full overhaul. Therefore, the following is my vision as a 34-year veteran teacher of how NYSED can fulfill the federal government's mandate of state testing that will essentially do away with the one-size-fits-all mentality and eliminate the Commissioner King's reasoning that it's a federal mandate. The first step is to have local teachers create the state assessments based on whatever standards, Common Core, whatever. Each assessment will be demonstrating how the standards are being implemented, uh, implemented in the classroom. It will also give teachers the ability to accommodate those with developmental disabilities, English language learners, and low performing students through assessments appropriate for their level and ability. These assessments will include rigorous, age appropriate content that can be logical, sequential, and feasible. Second step is to then have these assessments submitted to NYSED for evaluation and approval through an evaluation committee to ensure that the assessments fulfill those standards. The evaluation and approval process committee will be established consisting, uh, cons um, consisting of 10 year or more veteran classroom teachers or retired teachers. Step three, once the individual district students assessments are accepted and approved by the aforementioned evaluation team, each assessment piece upon completion by students will be placed into a student portfolio, much like portfolios that job applicants use to demonstrate their competency to their possible employer. This would give the local school districts, not the state, the ability to appropriately and more accurately assess students' problem solving, critical thinking, and teamwork skills they need to compete in a rapidly changing world. It will also allow students to redo, rewrite, revise, adjust, and rethink their assessment answers to more accurately demonstrate their growth, uh, uh, excuse me, the growth of the students' competencies and showcase the skills that were taught. Step four, in May of each school year, a pool of retired teachers along with district's current teachers will evaluate those student portfolios based on various established rubrics. This will be done within district. Students' current classroom teachers will not evaluate their own students' work, but only students that they do not currently have in the classroom to avoid a partiality in the evaluation process. And the final step, the state will be able to afford this process of paying all these extra evaluators and evaluation teams by eliminating Pearson's part in it. Since Pearson's printed assessments in the past three years were riddled with errors and age-inappropriate language, the state can break the contract since the product was faulty. They can then use the money that they would save to pay those teachers who will be grading the assessments. This will create jobs, save millions of dollars that was paid to Pearson, and bring that money into the schools to provide materials and equipment to be used to help students achieve. In conclusion, it is teachers that develop proper assessments, not big publishing companies that institute fabricated assessments with no regard for differentiated learning and no educational experience in the classroom. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Teddy Arolia, is that? Did I get that even close, Teddy? Pretty close. 
So why don't you tell me how you pronounce your last name? It's pronounced Uriola in English. Uriola, Uriola in Spanish. Uh, Uriola. But I'm known as Miss Teddy. Miss Teddy, I like that. Miss Teddy, you're on. My name is Teddy Uriola, and I came here um, tonight with a speech that kind of long, and I put it in your written testimony box. It's full of all kinds of statistics that many different people have touched on tonight. What I'd really like to do for you tonight is to put a human face on my classroom. I'm a teacher in the Rochester City School District, and I'm going to tell you a story tonight about four little girls and four little angels. These four little girls were in my kindergarten class and first grade class over a period of two years. After you've heard their story, I really want you to think about whether or not they needed Common Core, whether they needed more rigor, harsh and inflexible instruction, higher expectations, and more testing. Maya came to me in kindergarten. She's quiet. She had trouble learning, but didn't create any problems. She was never very clean or well-dressed. She was in my class again in first grade. I may have met the father and the stepmother once or twice in those two years. I found out at some point that Maya's mother had died before she came to kindergarten. On the last day of school, I got permission to take Maya out to lunch at Applebee's. We then went shopping at Walmart. Maya had never had little girly sneakers on or clothes. When we went to pick out the new shoes, she went to the boys' area. That way her brother could wear them when she outgrew them. I sent her into the dressing room with a couple of cute short sets and then asked the clerk to check on her. The clerk came back to tell me that she was wearing men's dirty underwear. I guess I needed to add panties to the shopping list. I gave Maya an angel to remember her mother and let her know that she was still watching over her and that I loved her too. Tashonda was always falling asleep in my class and, had never, and never had her homework done. In fact, it was usually never even removed from her backpack. I called home one afternoon ready to give my teacher talk to mom. And this is the story I heard. Mom got the kids up at 5 a.m. every day to take the bus across town to Grandma's so she could go to work. The kids then took the school bus back across town to school and then back again to Grandma's at the end of the school day. When Mom got out of work, she would then load them all back onto the RTS bus and take them home, only to have to cook, do laundry, give baths, and everything else that mothers have to do and get them into bed, all to do it over again the next day. Homework really wasn't at the top of their to-do list. Two years later, Tashonda's mom was murdered, shot on the front porch at a party. Another little angel. Even though she wasn't in my classroom any longer, I had formed that connection because of the one phone conversation, and I had learned not to be judgmental. Janelle. Janelle was lucky. She had a mom and a dad. They were both educated, a two-parent family. Dad was older and had retired from Kodak. He owned a cab, and he drove at night so that he could be with the girls in the day while mom worked. He was shot and killed one night in the cab. I think it's still listed as an unsolved homicide here in Rochester. Another little angel. Daddy really loved you, and so do I. Rosanique lived with her grandmother. Mom was in and out of trouble and in and out of her life. However, she was still mom. One of those times when she was in her life, she too was murdered. I think it was over drugs. Rosanique stayed in our school all the way through eighth grade, and she left last year for ninth grade. She came up to me one day before she left, and she told me kind of in secret, you know, I still have that little angel you gave me on my dresser. I told her, her, mommy still loves you, and so do I. Keep your nose clean, make good choices, 
I'm here if you need me. William Bruce Cameron said, not everything that counts can be counted. And not everything that can be counted counts. I believe that I try to live this every day, and I am not unique. So do all the other teachers in the Rochester City School District who choose to teach in the city. This is a labor of love, not of rigor. Our school boards, who we would have turned to in the past to have asked questions about this curriculum, have been rendered powerless. The only people who can stop this train wreck, known as the Common Core, are you gentlemen seated up in front. Many of my colleagues tonight have talked about implementation and rollout. They've talked about adapting, but that's not possible. Common Core is tied to Race to the Top, and we promised when we accepted that money that we would follow all the tenets of Race to the Top. You gentlemen have the power to stop that, turn back the clocks, and get rid of Race to the Top and Common Core in New York State. I would like to conclude with this quote by Winston Churchill. All that is necessary for evil to win is for good men to do nothing. Please do something. Stop the common core. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Betty. Angela Badone, is that right? Angela, are you here? Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you. And I must say that Teddy is a, a tough speech to follow. Um, actually, it's because of teachers like Teddy that I am here. Um, I moved to Rochester, New York, because of the wonderful housing market. And I came from Washington, DC, which is my hometown. I've worked for the National School Boards Association. I've worked for the American Psychological Association, doing policy and advocacy for special education. Uh, with school psychology and the practice of psychology in K-12 schools. I also have been the mental wellness program coordinator for the National Education Association's nonprofit affiliate, the NEA Health Information Network. That work came to me after the massacre at Columbine in 1999. That was as a result of a significant trauma. And I did my homework when I chose Rochester to move to. I chose Rochester because we have an incredible housing market. I also chose Rochester because I have been doing violence prevention work for years. And Rochester is the most dangerous city in New York State. But Rochester also has incredible assets. And the work that I did for NEA was informed by wonderful people across the country about what makes us resilient. We can't control all of the risk factors that our kids are going to be exposed to. And we've heard a lot of, from people here about the impact of poverty. But we also know that the middle class is shrinking and that increasingly middle class people are becoming poor. Recently, I took a trip down to Washington for a meeting. And I stayed a little bit longer after my meeting. And I attended an income and equality policy forum that had some tremendous speakers. Uh, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, former New York Times journalist Hedrick Smith was one of the speakers. He's the author of a book titled Who Stole the American Dream? And he identifies something called the Powell Memo, which was written in August of 1971 in Richmond by Lewis Powell, who was appointed to the Supreme Court two months after he wrote the memo. And basically the strategy in the Powell Memo explains a lot to me. What it boils down to is, Big business in August of 1971 was scared. We had a lot of different things happening. Women's rights, civil rights, Ralph Nader, the Environmental Protection Agency was created. So big business was concerned. And the strategy in the Pal Memo said, big business send lobbyists to Washington and buy up the media to control the message to influence voters to vote in our best interest, not their best interest. That explains a lot to me as a Washingtonian seeing what happened to my hometown as it mushroomed with lobbyists and money and, and corporate interests. 
And I'm very concerned because having worked in publication, public education for so many years, and particularly around the issues of violence prevention and promoting school mental health, and being concerned about the mental wellness of our teachers, because teaching is inherently a, a stressful profession. But we now have kids who are starving for parental attention. And when they come to school, they're starving for adult attention. With the standards and race to the top testing, I see that the teachers that I have advocated for, um, they have less time. They have less professional autonomy to be the responsive teachers like what we heard from Teddy. And that's what the kids need, because teaching and learning happens in the context of relationships. It doesn't happen in the context of rigid standards and high stakes standardized testing. And as I see that the trauma in our city here is quite high, and I believe as, I, as we're seeing so many things across the country, higher productivity, more hours spent at work, uh, troops returning home, there's going to be increasingly exposure to trauma. And it is teachers and the connections to schools, not the buildings, but to peers and teachers and other school staff that are what make our kids resilient. And the Common Core and Race to the Top does not allow for that to happen the way it used to be able to happen. And yet, here in Rochester, we have so many protective factors that we could bring. In addition to the wonderful housing market, Monroe County has one of the best library systems in the country. We don't have food deserts in this city. We have the public market. We do have a public transportation system that serves our city quite well relative to other cities. We have real strengths in this city. And if we're hamstrung by an education reform policy that basically, when students' test scores go down, corporate profits go up, I don't think we really need to get mired in the details. When it boils down to when students' test scores go down, corporate profits goes up, that's a problem. And we can do something about that. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Uh, I just need to interrupt for a uh, quick minute uh, just for a couple things. First of all, uh, I have to uh, depart because I have to go to another educational forum in Canandaigua this evening. It starts at 7 o'clock, so I have to scurry a little bit. Uh, also, the forum tonight was supposed to go to 6 o'clock. Uh, we're going to extend it a little while longer. Mark Johns and the, the rest of the guys here are going to continue on. But I have to say the Memorial Art Gallery has to have, has to have us out of here uh, before 7. And there's still a list of speakers to go through. So we're going to get as many as we can. Uh, but we're subject to uh, the Memorial Art Gallery's time frame here. The thing I would like to encourage, if we do not get you to speak tonight, to please make sure to contact your state assemblyman or woman and also your state senator uh, and please continue to forward us emails or letters uh, on anything that you'd like to share with us regarding tonight and, and again we'd love to hear from every single one of you but uh, we are under some time and logistical constraints and I just want to say personally I also want to thank again my colleagues that have joined me here today especially uh, Assemblyman Ed Ron and Al Graff, who are traveling all over the state uh, on behalf of our education committee, and uh, from their homes in Nassau and Suffolk County, I again want to send a very heartfelt thanks to, to both of them. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to Assemblyman Mark Johns, and again, thank you for being here tonight. Just for two seconds, look, we're, we're compiling testimony we're compiling what they're saying okay we're, we want to put it all together we're going to be presenting all right and it's so important to us so especially Ed and I and and, and our other members but while we're traveling we're trying to get all this information there are cards out front okay I think you've, you've seen it it's me pointing at the blackboard right and it says fix NY schools and so far we today we broke over 17,000 signatures, letters that went to the government. But on there, there's an email, okay? So if you have testimony, if we can't get to you, because there's a lot of people, and Ed and I have, have tried to give everybody as much as we can at all these forums, and if we had our choice, we'd be here at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning to make sure that everybody speaks. But unfortunately, we are under a time constraint here that's not of our making. But it is important for us to get all your information, 
right on here is my email okay please if you didn't submit your testimony give it to us so we can make it all part of this thank you okay next we have Elizabeth Hallmark okay uh, following up on that is Jennifer Lynn this um, I'm going to put the text out in the hallway. Um, one of my paragraphs here focuses on a couple of the books that are part of the third grade curriculum. Um, if you guys get a chance, it's really important if you guys look at the pictures. Um, oh, sorry. Is that better? Okay. Um, the pictures that are shown in some of the storybooks in the third grade curriculum. Um, so. Uh, thank you for being here to listen and to advocate for one of our most important responsibilities of our state, the education of our children. My name is Jennifer Lyons, and I'm here today because I'm a concerned parent. I'm concerned over the Common Core standards, and I'm extremely bothered by what I have found. I have a special interest. Her name is Leah, and she's a first grader in the Bloomfield School District. If you asked her last year how she liked school, she would have told you that she loved it. She was excited to learn, excited to see her friends every day, and excited to see her teacher that she absolutely adored. She would come home happy. She couldn't wait to tell me about her day. She would always come home with a smile on her face. Then, this year, things started to change for us about the second week of school. Little by little, the excitement started to fade. Notes started coming home on her math worksheet saying she needed support. The tears began every morning before school. I now have a child who is struggling and has fallen behind because she doesn't understand what she's being taught. There's no time for asking questions or getting clarification because there's so much material that needs to be covered throughout the day. There's no going back the next day to review. Um, it's on to the next topic that builds off the previous day's lesson. When I went to her teacher with my concerns about finding about finding out about getting her extra help, I was told that her hands are tied and that there's no more help available to the children in our district until they reach third grade, which is when the state tests begin. So what happens to the kids in grades kindergarten through second grade who are falling through the cracks? Not all families have the means to hire a tutor. Not all children learn in the same way. Some learn by listening, others learn by focusing, or others struggle with focusing and rely on learning through hands-on activities. I'm going to give you an example of a one-size-fits-all lesson on why it's clear this should never be an option for our children. I have a friend who owns a hair salon. Let's say that she's going to teach someone how to do a haircut. She's going to give her student a pair of scissors, scissors that are made for a right-handed person, even though the student is left-handed. She's also going to require that the person take their glasses off because she, as the instructor, doesn't wear glasses. So the student is going to be tested on a haircut she learned using scissors that are made for the wrong hand and without her glasses, which help her to see. This is exactly what our children are dealing with in their classroom right now. Some of our best teachers are innovators, and they have the ability to create an interesting and exciting classroom, which is how kids learn. The scripted, one-size-fits-all teaching approach that has been adopted has taken the joy out of learning for our children and the joy out of teaching for our teachers. I'm concerned about some of the material that our children are being exposed to. Two of the books are part of the third grade curriculum, and they're especially troublesome, and I'm sure many other parents with young children would agree. The one story is called Nazarene's Secret School, a true story from Afghanistan, written by Jeanette Winter. The story is about a little girl who is living with her grandmother. It talks about the soldiers coming into her house during the night and abducting the little girl's father. The picture on the page shows men with beards wearing turbans carrying large machine guns while they're dragging the father away. It goes on to talk about Nazreen sneaking away to a secret school, reading the Koran until confronted by an Afghan soldier who again is pictured with a large rifle in hand. Another piece of the third grade curriculum is called The Librarian of Basra. This story is about an Iraqi librarian. 
It's about her library being a meeting place for people who love books and for people to discuss matters of the world and spirit. Until now, they talk only of war. The pictures on this page show Iraqi people conversing with one another, saying, will planes with bombs fill the sky? Will the bombs fall here? Will soldiers with guns fill the streets? Who among us is going to die? Will our families survive? The story continues to talk about the soldiers with guns waiting on the roof. There's a, pictures, uh, there's a picture of soldiers on a roof with snipers. The city is lit with a firestorm of bombs and gunfire. There are pictures of jets flying in the sky with nothing but fire below and people scrambling. The library then burns to the ground. I understand that this could be part of a history or a social studies lesson, but the language being used as well as the illustration being shown are nothing short of intense. Is this the type of material that we want our children to objected to at eight years old? I love learning and I love the idea of raising our educational standards. However, I don't feel that Common Core is in our children's best interest. I want my child to be literate and well informed. I want her to be able to develop to her full potential. I want her to choose her career and have it be something that she loves and something that she's wonderful at rather than her career choosing her by what her scores indi indicate on the standardized test. But this isn't just about my daughter, this is about all children. All children deserve a quality education and all children deserve a chance to excel. It's not too late to take back our control. We have to do this for our kids. We have to do this for their future. I'd like to close by saying a quote from Albert Einstein. Everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it's going to live its whole life believing that it's stupid. Thank you, Jennifer. OK, Maureen Romeo. Good evening. I'll try to be quick. I've tried to um, tear this down a little bit. I've been teaching for 25 years, and I'm a uh, curriculum leader for English at Gates Chimai for English, uh, for 612 English. Uh, while most teachers agree that there are things in the Common Core Standards that are worthwhile, there are many problems with it, as we've all heard tonight. Um, the three major areas of concern for me are the assessments, number one, the materials that were not forthcoming and were poor at best, and the standards themselves, which need a lot of work. All right. Starting with the assessments, uh, three 90-minute days in a row for third graders through eighth graders is punishment, not education. There's too much testing. Children are crying, vomiting, wetting their pants. It's ridiculous. Many instructional days are lost due to administering and scoring the tests. The ELA this year is the first week in April. We'll still have two and a half months of schooling left. So why am I being evaluated on something when I can only get through three quarters of the information? The standards themselves tell us to have the students working at grade level by the end of the year, two and a half months later. The assessments assume that the students have already learned the standards from the grade levels below. Yeah, if this is our first or second year um, with the Common Core, how are we t testing them now? when they have only been doing it for two years. Why are we, that's ridiculous. Many of us never get, even get to see the exams. If we're lucky enough to see them on the day that they're administered, that's it. You can never ever see them again. It's forbidden to even discuss the exam. Teachers debate the answers to some of the questions. I had a science teacher one time tell me, oh yeah, look, I saw that question. Wow, the answer was blah, blah, blah. No, it wasn't. Sorry, yes, it looked like a science question, but being that you're a science teacher, you wouldn't have known that that was really an argumentative question, looking at argumentative writing, not at what it looked like to everybody else in the world, which was a science. There's no accountability for poorly designed tests. Every year, each test has questions that have multiple correct answers and questions with no correct answers. Taxpayers are wasting $33 million on poorly written tests. Writing doesn't even matter, because if a student writes a metaphor on the test, 
it's considered off-task. The test last year called for students to use close reading strategy, which is when they reread parts of the test. They have to reread over and over and over and over again. They had no time to finish the test. Also, as has been said before, the field test questions were embedded all over, not at the end where they should have been. And students had no idea which questions were the real questions, so they wasted their time on these ridiculous questions that have never been vetted. Um, as for evaluating teachers on uh, student test scores, that's also ridiculous. Um, this system is so bad that very poor teachers are getting great grades, and the hardest working best teachers are getting mediocre grades. They're frustrated. Why would you give a chemistry test to a teacher before they learn chemistry to see how well they do, and at the end of the year, give them another similar test and say, wow, look how much chemistry you learned. Wow, what a great teacher. That, that's ridiculous. That's what's happening. How about my sister who teaches music? 40% of her personal teacher evaluation is based on how the fifth graders score on the New York State ELA and math exams. She teaches music. Really? Uh, the biggest problem with the actual standards themselves is the um, disintegration of creativity. I had a good friend who was uh, in charge of America's, uh, a very huge corporation in Japan, an American corporation, and he told me that um, the biggest strength of Americans is their creativity. That is their strength in the world market. And that is what is being robbed with the Common Core. So, that is the problem. I tried to hurry it up as much as I could. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, do we have Joy Martin? Thank you. Okay, uh, Sha Yun Ross. Okay, uh, Dorothy Holloway. Okay, how about Liz Hallmark? Uh, David Hirsch. David Hirsch. I'm a professor in education at the Warner School of Education at the University of Rochester. I've been there for 25 years. For the last 15 years, my research has focused on the negative consequences of the high stakes testing in New York. Um, so it's, that's the area in which I have my research expertise. Thank you for holding this forum. Oh, I, I wrote a five minute statement. I think it's down to three. Thank you for holding this forum. I believe public education is at a crossroads, crossroads where we have two choices. Continue the, we can continue for the I'm sorry we can continue for the last 15 years of increased standardized testing in schools, which is according to the National Assessment of Education Progress, resulted in slower or no growth and widening achievement gap. Or we can engage in real reform, working with teachers to develop rich, challenging curriculum, better formative and summative assessments, and work with community members to improve the lives of our families by, by providing health care and jobs to safe communities. The first choice is exemplified by the Common Core State Standards. As you all know by now, only 31% of New York State students pass the exams. Commissioner King described the results as, quote, a good thing, because it provides us with, quote, a baseline. In response, I ask, if our students are really doing so poorly, doesn't that prove that the reform movement of increased testing and regimentation of the curriculum has failed? And doesn't the past use of testing already provide a baseline? Commissioner King states that the Common Core curriculum in testing equals high standards and implies that anyone who doesn't agree with him has lower standards. I have been an educator for over 40 years. And in my text that I'll leave for you, I describe some of the things I've done with students, including producing television shows, websites, uh, doing local histories, etc. And so I am not against high standards. I am for creating schools that have higher standards 
in the Common Core system. My problem with the Common Core that though is, through the, is that through the hasty development and implementation and increased standardized testing, less time is devoted to teaching and learning. I think one of the things that you really need to know about New York State is that none of the test scores have any validity. You cannot tell whether students are learning because test scores have gone up, whether the learning has improved because test scores have gone up, or that the learning has declined because the test scores have gone down. The test scores are manipulated by the commissioner to yield whatever results he wants to look good. I can give hundreds of examples, but just one. Over the last decade, New York, State's, New York State's test scores have increased at what I would describe and did describe as an unbelievable rate, for which commissioners of education and also New York City's mayor took credit. Finally, Chancellor Tisch, and this is one of the times when I agreed with her, admitted that the test scores were, quote, ridiculously inflated and, quote, should not be believed. Test scores were rescaled, and for that example, instead of six, and for example, instead of 68.8 percent of students scoring proficient on the English exams, only 42 percent were. Similarly, with the Common Core test that this we had in the last spring, it was purposely designed so that we would have a high failure rate. That was intentional. In response to the low test scores, Commissioner King and Chancellor Tisch ignore the harm that testing has already done to children and teachers and promise that the test scores will rise next year. Now, since they can manipulate the test score to have it come out however they want, I think we can be guaranteed that, in fact, there will be higher test scores next year because they will make sure it is done. In the meantime, they are ignoring the harm that, standard, that standardized testing in the Common Core has on our children and teachers. Therefore, I side with the majority of of parents and teachers who now think that there is too much testing in school and are encouraged by their passion and motivation. However, we need to talk about more than just test scores, and we are still failing our children in society. We need, at minimum, to do the following, and I want to at least say some things we should do positive. One, given that test scores closely are closely related to family and neighborhood poverty rates, we also need an economic agenda that provides jobs and hope for both parents and teachers. There is no point to being college and career ready. The only jobs available are minimum wage. Second, we need to have community conversations about the kind of education we want for our children. Three, we need to look at and incorporate other models of assessment, assessments that tell us more than whether a student is a one, a two, a three, or a four. Four, we are pushing, teaching, we are pushing excellent teachers out of the, out of the teaching profession and discouraging university students from becoming teachers. Jack Langeret testified earlier that, in fact, and I see this with my own students, when they are placed in public schools, the teachers are telling them, don't turn back, change your major, don't become teachers. It's not a profession worth entering anymore. And I recently surveyed all the local colleges and found out that half the, they now have half the enrollment in the teacher education programs that they had three years ago. We have to stop blaming teachers for the limitations of our educational system. We have to remember that all parents and teachers want their children and students to do well. So we need to rebuild trust in our teachers and work toward and improve our schools and communities. Fifth, we need a three-year moratorium on the Common Core tests so that we can sit down in our communities and develop strategies and curriculums so that we have excellent schools. We need real honest conversations like the one we're having here. I have been so impressed with the hearings and the intelligence of our parents and teachers. Sixth, and because all of the above requires that we have a commission of education who educators, parents, and community members feel can listen and engage in real dialogue. And our commissioner is no longer that person. Commissioner King needs to resign. Thank you. Uh, David, let me ask you one question. You, you mentioned Commissioner King a, a yep. couple of times in your speech. Where does he send his children to school? <laughs> well, he says he sends it to a Montessori school in New York City. Not a public school. Right. Thank, right, thank you. you. One more. 
<clears throat> just to let you know, Commissioner King right now is our best asset because every time he opens up his mouth, he brings other people to our side. There's a, there's a big fight up at the top then. <laughs> okay, uh, Lori Thomas. We might have, after Lori, we might have one more speaker and that uh, that might be uh, winding off down to the end. I apologize for that, but uh, Al, you've left the number of your cards out in the back, right? So uh, I, I, I instructed him to put a different picture. He used his own. I told him, I said, you know, you got to use something else, but... Uh, Al has uh, got the bill that everybody's going to be interested in, so make a, you know, well, I'll be handing out our cards, but make sure you pick up Al so you can get out of it. You have the uh, site to sign up for. Okay. okay. Before right. Lori starts, I could just, my understanding, some of you are leaving, that next Thursday, I think it is, WXXI is going to have Commissioner Penn uh, in their studio here in Rochester. And if you're interested in being in the audience for that, I think you can go to the WXXI website, or I don't know what the process is. Um, right. By tomorrow, and it's a lottery system. If you want to be in the audience. It's a lottery system. They just... Well, Teddy, they've got your name. You're not going to be alone. They've got your name, so forget about it. Okay, Lori, go ahead. It looks like you might be the last speaker. Well, then, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And I'd like to say thank you for everyone that came out to support our children and um, they threw out the whole event. My name is Lori Thomas, and I'm a retired teacher of 17 years. I came tonight to address the first three questions asked in your letter to the public. For many years, I have advocated for an amendment to the Constitution to include the right of every child in America to an excellent education, which means the creation of national standards. I feel it is important to have standards, but those standards must apply to everyone, not just certain groups. And to make it simple and easy, there should only be one standard, excellence. Your first question, are there components being left out of the new standards? Absolutely. The most important components, passion, creativity, ingenuity, integrity, and humanity. There is, however, only one unnecessary component, standardization. It is important that we realize having standards of excellence for our children is not the same as retrofitting our children to a set of arbitrary standards. With the implementation of the new curriculum based on Common Core standards, was it handled properly and appropriately? The backlash from all stakeholders in education makes it evident that the answer to this question is no. What can be implemented to improve the transition to the new curriculum? To improve the transition to the new curriculum based on Common Core standards, legislators and leaders in education can implement a change in the focus of education so that it concentrates on the gifts and talents of all children. Teachers must be able to bring their passion into the classroom with an attitude of authority in order to impassion their students to become leaders in whatever they choose to do in life. Parents must be included in every aspect of their children's educational life so that they can grow with the trial of being an excellent role model of success and becoming an adult. Implementing these three changes will surely lead to the educational success of every child. Finally, how has the new testing associated with Common Core affected students' attitudes toward learning? and how has it affected their instruction time and the approach of classroom teachers. According to the standards, the key ideas for reading at the third grade level are, one, ask and answer questions to demonstrate understanding of a text, referring explicitly to the text as the basis for the answers. Two, recount stories, including fables, folk tales, and myths from diverse cultures, determine the central message, lesson or moral, and explain how it is conveyed through key details in the text. And three, Describe characters in a story, example their traits, motivations, or feelings, and explain how their actions contribute to the sequence of events. In reviewing the 2010 third grade ELA standardized test for reading, the test does not ask the student to ask a question, retell the story, or describe a character. There is no opportunity to demonstrate understanding of the text, 
The test merely offers factual answers to vague and poorly written questions. There is no opportunity to describe characters and explain how their actions contribute to the sequence of events. Consequently, while teachers are teaching to the standards, students are perplexed by the standardized tests as they hold no relevance to the information they were given or held accountable for in the classroom. Students and teachers begin to reject the knowledge the teacher imparts in an effort to adhere to the standards and fall prey to the miseducation of a data-based, budget-driven system of education. In conclusion, I would like to ask you a question. Two weeks ago, at a forum that included Commissioner King, Chancellor Tisch, Vice Chancellor Batar, and Regents Brown and Norwood, I asked why the State Education Department accepted the Rochester City School District's DCIP, the um, District Comprehensive Improvement Plan, when it was incomplete, incomprehensible, did not address student improvement, and was submitted two days after the October 1st deadline. I have not yet received an answer to my question. So I ask you, who has the authority to hold the State Education Department responsible for not holding LEAs accountable for their failure? I appreciate the time you have given me to provide relevant research-based non-rhetorical answers to your question, and I would, I would appreciate a relevant, truth-based, non-rhetorical answer to my question. Our children must come first, or we all end up failing. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we have about 10 minutes, and we're not going to be able to allow enough time for the other speakers. I just want to acknowledge everyone that is willing to stand up and speak. Uh, hopefully, I get these names right. Jeremy Eaton, Paul Stack, Nancy Ramsey, Paul Petlin. Uh, should have brought my glasses then. Uh, Jermaine O'Neill, Chris Franklin, Juan, Juan Gears. William Baldwin, uh, Jeanette Keniston, Susan Engler, uh, John Piles, Day G. Kitzel, Lorraine Van Dyne, Jenny and Sierra Nakis, and uh, Marcy Sussler, Jeanette Keniston, Michael Balt, Joe Alati, and Joyce Kost. Uh Thank you all for coming. I want to especially thank my colleagues, Assemblyman Pauly and Noje, they do a great job of representing their district. I want to especially thank uh, Assemblyman Ed Ra and uh, the man of the hour, uh, Al Graft here, who's got the bill that everybody's going to want to see come to the floor. Um, the, biggest, the biggest problem at Albany is to be able to get good legislation to the floor. There's a lot of bills. We do 12,000 bills every two years. Only 10% of those bills come to the floor. Hopefully, Al Graff's bill will be one of those bills that come to the floor. Make sure that you uh, pick up one of his cards on the way out. They came all the way up from Long Island, and I'm telling you, that is a long haul. But they came up here to show their support for everybody in the audience. And uh, I want to tell you that I appreciate everybody that stayed at the end, the people that came earlier. And uh, I'll have my card here, and my colleagues will as well. So. Feel free to contact our office. Hopefully going forward we can straighten out this problem. Thank you very much for showing up.